This is the beginning of Chapter 5, Knowledge of Higher Worlds, Initiation, from the book An Outline of Esoteric Science by Rudolf Steiner. Between birth and death, human beings at our present stage of evolution experience three states of consciousness during ordinary life, waking, sleeping, and the state between them, dreaming. Dreaming will be considered briefly later on in this book, but here let's look at life in its two main alternating states, waking and sleeping. We achieve knowledge of higher worlds by acquiring a third state in addition to sleeping and waking. When we are awake, our souls are devoted to sensory impressions and the mental images they stimulate. When we sleep, these sensory impressions are silenced, but our souls also lose consciousness. The experiences of the day sink down into a sea of unconsciousness. Now, let's imagine that the sleeping soul is capable of becoming conscious in spite of the fact that all sensory perceptions are excluded, as is otherwise the case in deep sleep, and that not even a memory of the day's experiences is present. In that case, would the soul find itself in a state of nothingness? Could it be unable to have any experiences at all? It is only possible to answer these questions if we can actually induce a state of consciousness similar to this, if the soul is actually able to experience something even in the total absence of current and remembered sensory impressions. In this case, although the soul would seem asleep with regard to the ordinary outer world, it would not be asleep, but would confront a real world, just as it does in the waking state. Now, this state of consciousness can be induced if we bring about the soul experiences made possible by spiritual science. Everything spiritual science tells us about the worlds lying beyond the world of the senses, including the information given in preceding chapters of this book, has been investigated by means of this state of consciousness. This chapter will discuss, to the extent possible in this book, the methods used to create the state of consciousness needed for this research. This state of consciousness is similar to sleep in only one respect, namely that it puts an end to all outer sense impressions and eliminates all the thoughts stimulated by these impressions. But although during sleep the soul does not have the strength to experience anything consciously, this other state of consciousness provides this strength, awakening a perceptive ability that only sensory impressions can arouse during our ordinary life. The soul's awakening to this higher state of consciousness can be called initiation. Initiation methods lead us out of our usual state of waking consciousness into a soul activity that makes use of spiritual instruments of observation. These instruments are already present in the soul in a seminal state, but they need to be developed. Now it's possible for people to discover at a certain point in the course of their lives that these higher instruments have developed spontaneously without any special preparation and that a certain involuntary self-awakening has taken place. As a result, these people find that their essential nature is totally transformed and that their soul experiences are infinitely enriched. They also find that no knowledge of the sensory world can possibly provide the bliss, the soul satisfaction and inner warmth that they now experience as a result of what is being disclosed to understanding that is not accessible to the physical eye. Iwai. Strength and certainty will flow into their will from a spiritual world. Such instances of self-initiation do occur, but they should not tempt us to believe that the only right thing to do is to wait for this to happen and do nothing to bring initiation about through appropriate training. Since self-initiation can come about without observing rules of any sort, it is not necessary to talk about it here but what will be described is how training 
can develop the seminal organs of perception lying dormant in the soul. People who feel no particular urge to do something for the sake of their own development may easily say that human life stands under the guidance of spiritual powers and that instead of intervening in this guidance we should patiently await the moment when these powers find it right to disclose another world to our souls. These people may well feel that there is a certain presumptuousness or unjustified desire in wanting to interfere with wise spiritual guidance. People who think like this will change their minds only when one particular thought makes a strong impression on them. This thought is, quote, This wise guidance has given me certain faculties, not so that they will remain unused, but so that I can put them to use. The wisdom in this guidance lies in the fact that it has planted the seeds of a higher state of consciousness in me. I understand this guidance only if I feel that human beings have an obligation to reveal everything their own spiritual powers can possibly reveal. Unquote. If this thought has made a strong enough impression on the soul, then the above-mentioned doubts about training for a higher state of consciousness will disappear. However, another doubt can still arise about this training. We might say, quote, Developing inner soul faculties constitutes an intervention in an individual's hidden holiest of holies and involves a certain transformation of that person's entire nature. It is inherently impossible for us to independently conceive of the means for bringing about such a transformation because only those who have personally experienced reaching a higher world can know how to do it. But if we turn to a person like this, we permit that person to have an influence on our own soul's hidden holiest of holies. Unquote. Even having methods for bringing about a higher state of consciousness presented in book form would not be particularly reassuring to people who think like this, because the point is not whether we receive this information as an oral communication or learn about these methods from someone who knows about them and presents them in a book. There are indeed people who are knowledgeable about the rules for developing spiritual organs of perception, but subscribe to the view that these rules should not be entrusted to a book. In general, these people also consider it impermissible to communicate certain truths having to do with the spiritual world. Given the present stage of humankind's evolution, however, this view must be considered outdated in a certain way. It is true that we can go only so far in communicating the rules in question, but the information that can be provided leads far enough so that those who apply it to their own souls will reach a point in the development of their knowledge where they will then be able to discover the rest of the way. Only personal previous experience on the path to spiritual knowledge can give us the right idea about how this path then leads on. All these facts can give rise to doubts about the path to spiritual knowledge, but these doubts disappear when we consider the nature of the course of development indicated by the tra training that is appropriate to our times. This is the path that will be discussed here. Other methods of training will be mentioned only briefly. The training that will be discussed here will provide those who have the will to develop their higher faculties with the means for beginning to transform their souls. There is no question of dubious intervention in the student's inner nature unless the teacher attempts to bring about this transformation through methods that elude the student's consciousness. And no instruction in spiritual development that is appropriate for our times makes use of methods like that. Appropriate instruction does not make the student into an unconscious instrument. It supplies rules of conduct which the student then implements. When the occasion arises, the reason for laying down some particular rule will not be withheld. People searching for spiritual development do not need to receive and apply these rules as a matter of blind faith. In fact, blind faith is totally out of place in this area. If we have not yet begun spiritual training ourselves, 
but have considered the nature of the human soul simply as it reveals itself to our ordinary self-observation, we can ask ourselves, after receiving the recommended rules of spiritual training, how can these rules affect our soul life? Even without any training, we can answer this question adequately by applying our healthy common sense in an unbiased way. We can get the right idea of how these rules work even before we subject ourselves to them, although only training itself allows us to actually experience how they work. Even then, our experience will always be accompanied by understanding only if sound judgment accompanies each step we take. In this day and age, any true science of the Spirit will provide only rules that can stand up to the scrutiny of sound judgment. If we are ready and willing to undertake only this kind of training and do not permit any bias to drive us into blind faith, all our doubts will disappear. We will not be disturbed by any objections that can be raised about an appropriate training in attaining a higher state of consciousness. This training is not superfluous even for those whose inner maturity can eventually lead to self-awakening of their spiritual organs of perception. On the contrary, it is especially suitable for them because people like this almost invariably have to make many roundabout useless detours before self-initiation takes place. Training spares them these detours and leads them forward on a straight path. Self-initiation is a result of having achieved the appropriate degree of maturity during preceding lifetimes. It can very easily happen that a soul rejects training out of a certain dim sense of its own maturity since this feeling can create a certain arrogance that prevents the person from having confidence in a true spiritual training. It is also possible for a certain level of soul development to remain concealed and appear only at a certain age. In such cases, training can be exactly the right way to make it appear. But if the person in question remains closed to the possibility of training, it may well be that his or her ability will remain concealed during the present lifetime and will appear again only during some subsequent life. It is important to avoid certain obvious misunderstandings with regard to the training in supersensible knowledge that is intended here. One such misunderstanding can arise from thinking that this training intends to make its students into different beings with regard to how they lead their entire lives. But this is not a question of giving people general instructions on how to conduct their lives. It's a question of telling them about soul practices they can carry out in order to learn to observe the supersensible element. These practices have no direct influence on the parts of their lives that lie outside of supersensible observation. People acquire the gift of supersensible observation in addition to these other parts of their lives. This perceptive activity is just as separate from life's ordinary functions as the waking state is from sleep. One state cannot interfere with the other in the least. Wanting to have impressions of the supersensible interspersed in the course of life's ordinary events would be like dealing with constant unhealthy interruptions to your sleep when you are ill. The student must be able to induce the state of observing supersensible reality through an act of free will. Indirectly, however, supersensible training is related to certain standards of conduct inasmuch as insight into the supersensible is either impossible or harmful without a certain ethical attitude toward life. For this reason, much of what leads to supersensible observation is also a means of ennobling how to we lead our lives. On the other hand, insight into the supersensible world allows us to recognize higher moral impulses that also apply to the physical world of the senses. Certain moral necessities can only be recognized from the supersensible world. A second misunderstanding consists in believing that soul practices leading to supersensible cognition might involve changes in the physical body's structure or functioning. On the contrary, these practices have nothing at all to do with anything that is any business of physiologies or of any other branch of natural science, for that matter. 
They are purely spiritual soul processes that are as far removed from anything physical as healthy thinking and perception are. What happens in the soul as a result of such practices is no different in character from what happens during healthy thinking or conclusion forming. The processes involved in a real training in supersensible knowledge have just as much or little to do with the body as healthy thinking does, and anything that relates to the human being in any other way is a distortion of true spiritual training rather than the real thing. The presentation that follows is to be taken in the spirit of what has been said here. If supersensible training seems to require things that would make a person into something else, this is simply because supersensible cognition proceeds from a person's entire soul. In actual fact, it is simply a question of instruction in practices that make it possible for the soul to bring about moments in its life when it can observe the supersensible. It is only possible to rise to a state of supersensible consciousness from ordinary waking consciousness, the state the soul lives in prior to its ascent. Training provides the soul with methods that will lead it out of the ordinary waking state. Among the first methods provided by the training we are discussing here are some that can still be described as functions of ordinary waking consciousness. The most important of these consist of silent activities of the soul. The soul is meant to devote itself to certain specific mental images that have the intrinsic power to awaken certain hidden faculties in the human soul. Such mental images are different from those of our daily waking life, whose purpose is to depict outer things. The more truly they do this, the truer they themselves are, and it is part of their essential nature to be true in this sense. This is not the purpose of the mental images the soul concentrates on when its goal is spiritual training. These images are not structured so as to re reproduce anything external, but to have an awakening effect on the soul. The best thought pictures for this purpose are symbolic ones, but others can be used also. The content of these mental images is not the point. The point is that the soul devotes all its energies to having nothing in its consciousness other than the mental image in question. In our everyday soul life, the soul's energies are divided among many different things, and our mental images shift rapidly. In spiritual training, however, the point is to concentrate the soul's entire activity on a single mental image that is freely chosen as a focus for consciousness. For this reason, symbolic images are better than ones that represent outer objects or processes and have a point of contact with the outer world, since these do not force the soul to rely on itself to the same extent as it does with symbols that it creates out of its own energy. It's important, it's not important what is imagined, but only that the process of visualizing the image frees the soul from dependence on anything physical. By calling to mind the concept of memory, we can begin to grasp what it means to immerse ourselves in a visualized image. For example, if we look at a tree and then turn away from it so that we can no longer see it, we can reawaken the mental image of the tree out of our memory. The mental image we have of a tree when it is not actually present before our eyes is the memory of the tree. Now let's imagine that we retain this memory in our soul. We allow the soul to rest on this memory image and attempt to exclude all other images. Then the soul is immersed in the memory image of the tree. But although the soul is immersed in a mental image, this image is a copy of something perceived by our senses. However, if we attempt the same thing with an image that we insert into our consciousness through an act of free will, we will gradually be able to achieve the necessary effect. We will illustrate this with a single example of contemplating or meditating on a symbolic mental image. 
First, this mental image must be built up in the soul. I can do this as follows. I imagine a plant taking root in the ground, sprouting one leaf after another, and continuing to develop up to the point of flowering. Then I imagine a human being alongside this plant. In my soul I bring to life the thought that this human being has qualities and abilities that can be called more perfect than those of the plant. I think about how human beings are able to move around in response to their feelings and intentions while plants are attached to the ground. But then I also notice that although human beings are certainly more perfect than plants, they also have characteristics that we cannot perceive in plants, characteristics whose absence can actually make plants seem more perfect than humans. Human beings are filled with desires and passions which their actions obey, and certain errors result from these drives and passions. In contrast, I see how plants obey the pure laws of growth as they develop one leaf after another and open their flowers without passion to the chaste rays of the sun. I can say that human beings have an advantage over plants with regard to a certain type of perfection, but that the price they have paid for this perfection is to allow urges, desires and passions to enter their nature alongside the forces of the plants that seem so pure to me. Next, I visualize the green sap flowing through the plant and imagine this as an expression of the pure, passionless laws of growth. Then I visualize the red blood flowing through human arteries and imagine it as an expression of urges, desires and passions. I allow, I allow all this to arise in my soul as a vivid thought. Then I think about how human beings are capable of development, how they can use the higher soul faculties to cleanse and purify their urges and passions. I think about how this destroys a baser element in these urges and passions, which are then reborn on a higher level. The blood may then be imagined as the expression of these cleansed and purified urges and passions. For example, in the spirit I see a rose and say, in the red sap of the rose blossom I see the color of the plant's green sap transformed into red, and the red rose, like the green leaf, obeys the pure, passionless laws of growth. Let the red of the rose symbolize the blood that is an expression of purified urges and passions. They have been stripped of their baser element and are now similar in purity to the forces that are active in the red rose. I now try not only to assimilate these thoughts with my intellect, but also to bring them to life in my feeling. I can have a blissful sensation when I imagine the growing plant's purity and absence of passion. I can generate a feeling in myself for the price human beings must pay for greater perfection by acquiring urges and desires. This can transform my earlier bliss into a serious feeling. Next, a feeling of liberating happiness can stir in me as I devote myself to the thought of the red blood that can become the vehicle of inwardly pure experiences, just like the red sap of the rose blossom. It is important not to unfeelingly confront the thoughts that serve to build up a symbolic mental image such as this. After having basked in these thoughts and feelings, we transform them into this symbolic image. We imagine a black cross. Let this be the symbol of the baser element that has been eliminated from our urges and passions. We imagine seven radiant red roses arranged in a circle where the two beams of the cross intersect. Let these be the symbol of the blood that is an expression of cleansed, purified passions and urges. Footnote. The point here is not the extent to which any particular natural scientific view can or cannot find these thoughts justifiable. The point is to develop thoughts about plants and human beings that can be acquired by means of simple direct observation without any theory whatsoever. These thoughts do have a va value alongside other more theoretical ideas parenthesis, which are no less valuable in other respects parenthesis, about things in the outer world. In this case, the purpose of these thoughts is not to present facts in a scientific way, but to build up a symbol that proves effective on a soul level, regardless of whatever objections may occur to one or the under other individual 
as it is being built up. Rudolf Steiner, footnote, end of footnote. This symbolic image must now be called up before our mind's eye in the way described earlier with regard to a memory image. A symbolic mental image such as this has the power to awaken our souls when we inwardly immerse ourselves in it and devote ourselves to it. We must try to exclude all other mental images while we are immersed in this one. We must allow only this symbol to linger before our mind's eye in the spirit and it must be as vivid as possible. It is not without significance that this symbol was not immediately proffered as a soul awakening image but was first built up by means of specific ideas about plants and human beings because the effectiveness of a symbol like this depends on its being put together in this way before it is used for meditation. If we imagine it without first having gone through this build-up in our own souls, the symbol remains cold and is much less effective than it ha if it has received its soul-illuminating power through this preparation. During meditation, however, we should not summon up all of these preparatory thoughts but should only allow the image to linger vividly before us in the spirit while permitting the feeling we had as a result of these preparatory thoughts to resonate. In this way the symbol becomes a token of this experience of feeling and its effectiveness is due to the fact that the soul dwells on this experience. The longer we can dwell on it without a different and disruptive image intervening, the more effective the whole process will be. However, outside of the time we set aside for actual meditation, it is a good idea to frequently repeat the process of building up the image through thoughts and feelings of the type described above so that the feeling doesn't fade away. The more patience we have in renewing it, the more significant the image becomes for our souls. Parenthesis, additional examples of methods of meditation are described in my book How to Know Higher Worlds. Dis uh, um, described there are meditations on becoming and dying in plants, the creative forces lying dormant in seeds, the forms of crystals, and so on, which are especially effective. The intent here was to use a single example to demonstrate the nature of meditation. Parenthesis. A symbol, such as the one described here, is not a copy of any outer thing or being that nature has produced. But this very fact gives it the power to awaken certain faculties that are strictly soul-like in character. However, an objection could be raised to this. Someone might say, quote, It's true that the symbol as a whole is not present in nature, but all its details have been borrowed from nature, the black color, the roses, and so on. All these things are perceived by the senses, unquote. Anyone who is bothered by this objection should consider the fact that the process of reproducing the sense perceptions is not what leads to awakening our higher soul faculties, but that this is brought about solely through how these details are combined and the combination itself does not depict anything that is present in the world of the senses. This symbol was intended to illustrate the process of effective meditation. In spiritual training, any number of images of this sort could be used, and they could be built up in many different ways. Certain sentences, phrases, or single words may also be assigned as subjects for meditation. The goal of all these methods of meditation, however, is to tear the soul away from sensory perception and to rouse it to activity in which physical sense impressions are meaningless and the development of dormant inner soul faculties becomes the essential thing. It is also possible to meditate only on feelings, sensations, and so on, and such meditations prove to be especially effective. Let's take the feeling of joy, for example. In the normal course of our lives, our souls may experience joy when an outer stimulus for it is present. A soul with healthy feelings, who sees a person doing something out of the goodness of his or her heart, will experience satisfaction and joy. But this soul can then proceed to think about an action of this sort, saying, quote, 
When something is done out of the goodness of someone's heart, the person in question is acting not in his or her own interest, but in the interest of fellow human beings. Such an action may be called morally good." Unquote. The meditating soul, however, can free itself completely from its mental image of the individual case in the outer world that has given it joy or satisfaction, and it can then form a comprehensive idea of good-heartedness. Perhaps it thinks of how good-heartedness comes about when one's soul absorbs another's interest and makes it its own. The meditating soul can then feel joy in this moral idea of good-heartedness. This joy is not due to any process in the sensory world. It is joy in an idea as such. If we attempt to keep such joy alive in the soul for a certain length of time, we are meditating on a feeling, a sensation. What then becomes effective in arousing our inner soul faculties is not the idea itself, but rather the ongoing influence of a feeling within the soul that has not been stimulated by a mere individual outer impression. Since supersensible knowledge is able to delve more deeply into the essence of things than our ordinary thinking, meditating on feelings derived from supersensible experience is much more effective in developing soul faculties. As necessary as this may be for higher levels of training, we must be aware that we can go quite far simply through energetic meditation on feelings and sensations of the sort typified by the meditation on good-heartedness. Since people differ in their essential character, different training methods will be effective for different individuals. With regard to how long meditation should last, we must keep in mind that the calmer and more deliberate this meditation can become, the stronger its effect will be. However, any excesses in this direction should be avoided. The exercises themselves teach us a certain inner discretion and can show us the limits to observe in this regard. As a rule, such meditation exercises will have to be carried out for a long time before the person doing them is able to perceive their results. Patience and persistence are absolute prerequisites of spiritual training. People who do not summon up both of these attitudes, who do not calmly continue to do their exercises with patience and persistence, forming a constant underlying mood in their souls, will not accomplish much. It should have become evident by now that meditation is a means of acquiring knowledge about higher worlds. However, it should also be evident that not just any arbitrary thought content will lead to this knowledge, but only one that has been organized as described. The path that is pointed out here leads first to what can be called imaginative cognition, which is the first stage of higher knowledge. Cognition based on sensory perceptions and their assimilation by the sense-bound intellect can be called object cognition in the sense of spiritual science. Beyond this lie higher levels of cognition, the first of which is imaginative cognition. The term imaginative may cause doubts on the part of those who think of imagination only in terms of illusory ideas that don't correspond to, to anything real. In spiritual science, however, imaginative cognition must be understood as cognition that comes about through a supersensible state of consciousness in the soul. Our senses have no access to the spiritual realities and beings that are perceived in this state. Because this state of consciousness is awakened in the soul by meditating on symbols or imaginations, the world belonging to this higher state of consciousness can be called the imaginative world and the cognition that applies to it can be called imaginative cognition. Therefore, imaginative means something that is real in a different sense than the realities and beings of sensory physical perception. The content of the mental images that fill our imaginative experience is not important at all. What is important is the soul faculty that this experience develops. One very natural objection to using the symbolic images described here is that they are shaped by dreamlike thinking and 
arbitrary imagination and can therefore only have dubious results. Doubts of this sort are unjustified with regard to the particular symbols that form the basis of genuine spiritual training because these symbols are chosen in such a way that it is entirely possible to disregard their connection to any outer sensory reality and to seek their value only in the force they exert on the soul when it withdraws all of its attention from the outer world, suppresses all sensory impressions and excludes all thoughts it might entertain as a result of external stimulation. The meditative state is best illustrated by comparing it to the sleeping state. These two states are similar to one respect. Excuse me, let me read that again. These two states are similar in one respect and totally opposite in another. Meditation is sleep that constitutes a higher form of wakefulness in comparison to our ordinary consciousness during the day. The important point is that concentrating on the idea or image in question forces the soul to summon up much stronger forces from its own depths than it does in ordinary life or ordinary cognition. This increases its inner liveliness. It frees itself from the body just as it does during sleep, but without falling into a state of unconsciousness. Instead it experiences a world it did not experience before. Although this soul state is similar to sleep in that the soul is released from the body, in comparison to ordinary day consciousness it can be described as a state of heightened wakefulness. This allows the soul to experience itself in its true inner independent nature. In contrast, because the soul's own forces do not develop to the same extent in the ordinary daily waking state, it can only become conscious of itself there with the help of the body. As a result, it does not experience itself, but only becomes aware of itself in the reflection-like image that the body, or actually the body's processes, presents to it. By their very nature, Symbols built up in the way described above do not yet relate to anything real in the spiritual world. They serve to free the human soul from sensory perception and from the brain, the instrument to which our intellect is initially bound. This cannot happen before we feel that we are imagining something by means of forces that do not use the brain and the senses as their tools. The first thing we experience on this path is this process of being freed from our physical organs. We can then say that our consciousness is not extinguished when we disregard sensory perceptions and ordinary intellectual thinking. We are able to rise above them and experience ourselves as individual beings alongside what we were previously. This is the first purely spiritual experience, observing an I-being of soul and spirit, a new self that has risen up out of the self that is bound only to the physical senses and the physical intellect. If we freed ourselves from the world of the senses and the intellect without meditation, we would sink down into the nothingness of unconsciousness. Of course, we each have a being of soul and spirit prior to meditation, but at that point it has no tools for observing the spiritual world. It is something similar to a physical body without eyes for seeing or ears for hearing. The energy applied during meditation first creates organs of soul and spirit in a previously unorganized soul-spiritual being. What is created in this way is also the first thing we perceive. So in a certain sense our first experience is a self-perception. It belongs to the very nature of spiritual training that at this point in its development the soul practicing self-education is fully conscious of the fact that it first perceives, perceives itself in the world of images, imaginations, that appears as a result of the exercises that have been described. Although these images appear to be living in a new world, the soul must recognize that to begin with they are nothing more than a reflection of its own being strengthened by these exercises. 
Not only must the soul recognize this and assess the situation correctly, it must also have developed its will sufficiently to be able to remove or extinguish these images from consciousness at any time. Within these images the soul must be able to act freely and completely deliberately. This belongs to a genuine spiritual training at this point. If the soul were not able to do this, its situation in the domain of spiritual experience would be similar to that of a soul in the physical world if its eyes were fixated on objects and unable to look away. There is only one exception to the rule that it must be possible to extinguish images, and that is a group of inner pictorial experiences that must not be extinguished at this stage of spiritual training. They correspond to the core of the soul's own being. In these images, <clears throat> each student of the spirit recognizes his or her fundamental being, the aspect of the self that moves through repeated earth lives. At this point, sensing repeated earth lives becomes a real experience. In all other instances, however, the above-mentioned independence with regard to spiritual experiences must prevail. Only after having acquired the ability to extinguish our experiences do we approach the real spiritual world outside of ourselves. In place of what we have extinguished, something else appears and we recognize its spiritual reality. We feel that our souls are outgrowing something undefined and becoming something defined. We must then move on from self-perception to observing an outer world of soul and spirit. This happens when we structure our inner experience along the lines of what will be described next. The end of the first part of chapter 5. I have finished paragraph 17 on page 302 of An Outline of Esoteric Science. This is a reading of An Outline of Esoteric Science by Rudolf Steiner. I'm on chapter 5. This is the second part. I'm on um, paragraph 18. To begin with, the souls of spiritual students are weak with regard to everything that is perceptible in the world of soul and spirit. During meditation, they will have to expend a great deal of inner energy to hold on to the symbols or mental images that they have to that they have built up out of the sense world's stimuli. But if they also want to achieve real observation in a higher world, they must be able to do more than merely hold on to these visualizations. Having done this, they must also be able to spend a certain amount of time in a state that not only permits no stimuli from the outer world of the senses to affect the soul, but also eliminates the earlier visualizations from consciousness. Only after this has been done can what has taken shape through meditation appear in consciousness. The point is that from now on the soul must have enough inner strength so that what has taken shape in this way is really perceived spiritually and does not escape attention, which is all too possible when the soul's inner energy is still only weakly developed. The organism of soul and spirit which begins to develop and which the student is meant to grasp in self-perception is delicate and fleeting. The disturbances from the sense perceptible outer world and from its after effects in memory are great no matter how hard we try to keep them at bay. It is not just a question of the disturbances we notice, but even more of those but even more of those we are completely unaware of in ordinary life. <clears throat> Let me read that last sentence again. It is not just a question of the disturbances we notice, but even more of those we are completely unaware of in ordinary life. However, in this context, the very nature of the human being makes this transitional state possible. It is possible for the soul to accomplish in the sleeping state what is initially impossible for it in the waking state because of disturbances from the physical world. If we devote ourselves to inner contemplation and are then properly attentive to what happens during sleep, 
we will notice that we are not quote-unquote fast asleep, that our souls have times when they are still active in a certain way in spite of being asleep. During these states, natural processes keep the influences of the outer world at bay, even though the waking soul is not yet strong enough to ward them off under its own power. But if the meditation exercises have already taken effect, the soul frees itself from unconsciousness during sleep and senses the world of spirit and soul. This can happen in two different ways. Either we are able to realize during sleep that we are now in another world, or we are able on waking to recall having been there. The first instance requires greater inner energy than the second, which is, therefore, more prevalent among beginners in spiritual training. Students can gradually get to the point where they realize, after they wake up, that the whole time they were sleeping was spent in another world, and that they emerged from this world when they woke up. Their memories of the beings and realities of this other world will become ever more definite. In one sense or another, what can be called, quote, continuity of consciousness, unquote, that is, the continuation of consciousness during sleep, has set in. This does not mean, however, that these people are always conscious during sleep. It is already a big step toward continuity of consciousness. If people who otherwise sleep just like anyone else have certain times when sleep, during sleep, when they can look as though consciously into a world of spirit and soul, or if they can look back in memory on these brief conscious states when they are awake. We must not forget, however, that what is described here is only meant to be a transitional state. If our purpose is to train ourselves, it's good to go through this transitional state, but we should not believe that we should derive a conclusive view of the world of spirit and soul from it. In this state the soul is uncertain and not yet able to trust its perceptions. Through such experiences, however, it gathers more and more strength in order eventually to be able to keep the disturbing influences of the physical outer and inner worlds at bay when it is awake, and thus to observe the world of soul, spirit and soul without being distracted by any impressions coming from the senses, by the intellect that is bound to the physical brain, or even by the mental images of meditation which are merely a preparation for spiritual sight and have now been removed from consciousness. Anything spiritual science makes public in any form should never originate in any other kind of soul-spirit observation than the one that occurs in the fully waking state. Two soul experiences are important as our spiritual training continues. One is what makes us able to say, quote, from now on, when I disregard all the impressions the physical outer world can give me and look into my inner self, I will not be looking at a being whose activity is totally extinguished, but at a being who is aware of itself in a world I knew nothing about as long as I allowed myself to be stimulated only by impressions from my senses and from my ordinary intellect." At this, po at this moment the soul has the feeling of having given birth to a new being within itself, to the essential core of its own being as described above. This new being has characteristics that are totally different from those previously present in the soul. The other experience is that of having the old being standing like a second being alongside the new. What we formerly experienced as containing us now turns into something we confront from outside in a certain respect. At times we experience ourselves outside of what we each otherwise regarded as our own essential being, as the individual I. It is as if we were now fully conscious of living in two eyes. One of them we have known all along, the other stands above it like a newborn being. We feel how the first acquires a certain independence with regard to the second, somewhat similar to how the human body has a certain independence with regard to the first I. 
This experience is very significant because it makes us realize what it means to live in the world we are trying to reach through our training. The second newborn I can now be guided into perception in the spiritual world. Within it something can develop that has the same significance for this spiritual world as the sense organs have for the physical world of the senses. Once this development has advanced to the necessary level, we will not only sense ourselves as newborn eyes, but will begin to perceive spiritual realities and spiritual beings in the surroundings, just as we perceive the physical world through our physical senses. This is a third important experience. To really cope at this level of spiritual training, we must count on the fact that self-love and egotism will accompany the strengthening of our soul forces, appearing to a degree that we never experience in our ordinary soul life. It would be a mistake to believe that mere ordinary self-love is what we are talking about at this point. At this level of development, this powerful egotism is intensified to the point where it seems like a force of nature within our own souls, and a rigorous will training is required in order to overcome it. This egotism is not produced by spiritual training. It is always present, but becomes conscious only when we experience the spirit. It is absolutely necessary for will training to go hand in hand with our other spiritual training. We have a strong urge to feel blissfully happy in the world we have just created for ourselves. As described above, we must be able to extinguish, so to speak, what we have just worked so hard to bring about. Having reached the imaginative world, we must extinguish ourselves. But egotism's strongest urges agitate against this. It is easy to believe that the exercises of spiritual training are something external and disregard the soul's moral development. In response, it must be said that the moral strength that is needed to overcome egotism, as has been described, cannot be acquired without elevating the soul's moral state to the corresponding level. Progress in spiritual training is unthinkable unless it is accompanied by moral progress. Without moral strength, it would be impossible to defeat egotism. All talk of genuine spiritual training, let me read that again, all talk of genuine spiritual trainings not being a moral training at the same time is inaccurate. Only those who have not experienced this personally can doubt our ability to know that we are dealing with realities in what we believe to be spiritual perceptions and not with mere self-deceptions, parenthesis visions, hallucinations and the like, parenthesis. The real fact of the matter, however, is that if we have reached this level through a genuine training, we will be able to distinguish mental images of our own creation from spiritual realities in the same way that any individuals of sound common sense can distinguish their own mental images of a hot piece of iron from the actual existence of a piece they are touching. Healthy experience and nothing else reveals the difference. Even in the spiritual world, life itself is the touchstone. Just as we know in the sense-perceptible world that an imagined piece of iron will not burn our fingers, no matter how hot we imagine it to be, trained students of the spirit know whether they are experiencing a spiritual fact only in their imagination, or whether real facts or beings are making an impression on their awakened spiritual organs of perception. The general rules we have to observe during spiritual training so as not to fall victim to deceptions in this regard will be described later on. At this point it is extremely important for students of the spirit to have acquired a very specific state of soul when they first became conscious of the newborn eye, since it is through the eye that we become able to guide our sensations, mental images and feelings, our urges, desires and passions. Perceptions and mental images cannot be left to their own devices in the soul. They must be controlled through thoughtful deliberation. The I is what implements the laws of thinking and uses them to bring order into our life of thoughts and mental images. Something similar is true of our desires, urges, inclinations and passions. Our ethical principles become the guides for these soul forces. 
through moral judgment, the eye becomes the soul's guide in this area. If an individual then extracts a higher eye from the ordinary one, the original eye becomes independent in a certain respect, and it loses as much vital strength as is given to the higher eye. Let's suppose, however, that an individual who has not yet developed sufficient ability and stability with regard to laws of thinking and powers of judgment chooses to give birth to the higher eye on this level. This person will only be able to leave behind as much thinking ability for his or her lower eye as was developed previously. If the amount of orderly thinking is insufficient, a disorderly, confused, fantastical type of thinking and judging will appear in this person's newly independent, ordinary eye. Because the newborn eye in such a person can also only be weak, the confused lower eye will dominate supersensible perception, and the person in question will not demonstrate balance in judging his or her observations of the supersensible. If this person had developed the faculty of logical thinking sufficiently, it would have been quite safe to allow the lower eye to be independent. This is also true in the domain of ethics. If we have not achieved firmness in our moral judgments, if we have not sufficiently mastered our inclinations, urges and passions, we will allow the ordinary eye to become independent under circumstances in which these soul forces are still active. As a result, we may, not, we may not apply the same high standards of truthfulness to our experiences of supersensible cognition as we do to what we raise to the level of consciousness in the outer physical world. With this slackened sense of truth, we could take all kinds of fantastic imaginings for spiritual reality. Firmness in ethical judgments, steadiness of character, and thoroughness of conscience must work into our sense for truth, having first been developed in the eye that is left behind before the higher eye becomes active for purposes of supersensible cognition. This is not meant to scare people away from spiritual training, but it does have to be taken very seriously. If we have the strength of will to do everything necessary to make the first eye inwardly secure in carrying out its functions, we have no reason to be afraid of freeing the second eye through spiritual training to pursue supersensible cognition. However, we must be aware of how powerful self-deception is when it comes to feeling mature enough to undertake something. Students in the spiritual training that is described here develop their thought life to the extent that they will never be in danger of going astray, although this is often assumed to be inevitable. This thought development makes all the necessary inner experiences appear and be played out in the soul as they should be, without being accompanied by harmful aberrations of fantasy. Without appropriate thought development, these experiences can cause profound uncertainty in the soul. Through so the method emphasized here, these experiences appear in such a way that it is possible to become completely familiar with them, just as we become familiar with perceptions of the physical world if we are in a sound state of mind. By developing our thought life, we become more able to observe what we are experiencing in ourselves. If we do not develop it, we will not be able to face this experience in a calm and collected manner. An appropriate training lists certain qualities that those who want to find the way into the higher world should acquire through practice. These are, above all, the soul's mastery over its train of thought, its will and its feelings. The method for bringing this mastery about through practice has two goals. On the one hand, this practice is meant to imbue the soul with stability, certainty and equilibrium to the extent that it retains these qualities even when a second eye is born out of it. On the other hand, it is meant to give this second eye strength and support for its journey. Objectivity is what our thinking needs most of all for spiritual training. 
in the physical world of the senses, life is the great teacher of the human eye as far as objectivity is concerned. If the soul chose to allow its thoughts to wander aimlessly, it would have to be immediately corrected by life so as not to come into conflict with it. The soul's thinking must correspond to the actual course of life's realities. When we turn our attention away from the physical world of the senses, we are no longer subject to its automatic correction, so our thinking will go astray if it is not able to self-correct. This is why students of the spirit must train their thinking so that it can set its own direction and goals. Their thinking must teach itself inner stability and the ability to stick strictly to one subject. For this reason, the appropriate, quote, thought exercises, unquote, we undertake should not deal with unfamiliar and complicated objects, but with ones that are simple and familiar. Over a matter of months, if we can overcome ourselves to the point of being able to focus our thoughts for at least five minutes a day on some ordinary object, parenthesis, for example, a pin, a pencil, or the like, parenthesis, and if during this time we exclude all thoughts unrelated to this object, we will have made a big step in the right direction. Parenthesis, we can consider a new object each day or stay with the same one for several days. Parenthesis. Even those who consider themselves thinkers because of their scientific education should not scorn this means of preparing themselves for spiritual training. Because if we fix our thoughts on something very familiar for a certain period of time, we can be certain that we are thinking objectively. If we ask, what is a pencil made of? How are these materials prepared? How are they put together to make pencils? When were pencils invented? And so on. Our thoughts correspond to reality much more closely than they do if we think about the origin of human beings or the nature of life. <clears throat> Simple thought exercises are better for developing objective thinking about the Saturn, Sun, and Moon phases of evolution than any complicated scholarly ideas, because what we think about is not the point, at least initially. The point is to think objectively, using our own inner strength. Once we have taught ourselves objectivity by practicing on sense-perceptible physical processes that are easily surveyed, our thinking becomes accustomed to striving for objectivity, even when it does not feel constrained by the physical world of the senses and its laws. We break ourselves of the habit of allowing our thoughts to wander without regard for the facts. The soul must become a ruler in the domain of the will, just as it is in the world of thoughts. Here again life itself appears as the controlling element in the physical world of the senses. It makes us need certain things, and our will feels roused to satisfy these needs. For the sake of higher training, we must get used to strictly obeying our own commands. If we do this, we will become less and less inclined to desire non-essentials. Dissatisfaction and instability in our life of will, however, are based on desiring things without having any clear concept of realizing these desires. This dissatisfaction can disrupt our entire mental life when a higher I is trying to emerge from the soul. A good exercise is to tell ourselves to do something daily at a specific time over a number of months. Today, at this particular time, I will do this. We then gradually become able to determine what to do and when to do it in a way that makes it possible to carry out the action in question with great precision. In this way we rise above damaging thoughts such as, quote, I'd like this, but I want to do that, quote, unquote, with which disregard totally the feasibility of what we want. A very great man put these words into the mouth of a seer, quote, I love whomever longs for the impossible. Unquote. Footnote Goethe Faust, Part Two, Act Two. End footnote. This great man himself said, quote, "Living in ideas means treating the impossible as if it were possible." Unquote. Footnote Goethe, Verses in Prose. End footnote. These statements, however, should not be used as objections to what has been presented here, because what Goethe and his seerous Manto ask can only be accomplished by those who have trained themselves in desiring what is possible in order 
to then be able to apply their strong will to, quote, impossibilities, unquote, in a way that transforms them into possibilities. For the sake of spiritual training, the soul should also acquire a certain degree of composure with regard to the domain of feeling. For this to happen, the soul must master its expressions of joy and sorrow, pleasure and pain. There are many prejudices that become evident with regard to acquiring this particular quality. We might imagine that we would become dull and unreceptive to the world around us if we are not meant to empathize with rejoicing or pain. However, this is not the point. The soul should indeed rejoice when there is reason to rejoice, and it should feel pain when something sad happens. It is only meant to master its expressions of joy and sorrow, of pleasure and displeasure. With this as our goal, we will soon notice that rather than becoming dulled to pleasurable and painful events in our surroundings, the opposite is true. We are becoming more receptive to these things than we were previously. Admittedly, acquiring this character trait requires strict self-observation over a long period of time. We must make sure that we are able to empathize fully with joy and sorrow without losing ourselves and expressing our feelings involuntarily. What we are meant to suppress is not our justified pain, but involuntary weeping, not our abhorrence of a misdeed, but blind rage, not alertness to danger, but fruitless fear, and so on. Exercises like this are the only way for students of the spirit to acquire the mental tranquility that is needed to prevent the soul from leading a second unhealthy life like a shadowy double alongside the higher eye when this eye is born and especially when it begins to be active. Especially with regard to these things, it is important not to succumb to self-deception. It can easily seem to people that they already possess a certain equilibrium in ordinary life and that they therefore do not need this exercise, but in fact it is doubly necessary for people like this. It's quite possible to be calm and composed in confronting things in ordinary life and yet have our suppressed lack of equilibrium assert itself all the more when we ascend into a higher world. It is essential to realize that for purposes of spiritual training, what we seem to possess already is much less important than systematically practicing what we need to acquire. This sentence is quite correct regardless of how contradictory it may seem. No matter what life may have taught us, what we teach ourselves is what serves the purposes of spiritual training. If life has taught us excitability, we need to break that habit. But if it has taught us complacency, we need to shake ourselves up through self-education so that our soul's reactions correspond to the impressions they receive. People who cannot laugh at anything have as little control over their lives as people who are constantly provoked to uncontrollable laughter. An additional way of training our thinking and feeling is by acquiring a quality we can call positivity. There is a beautiful legend that tells of Christ Jesus and several other people walking past a dead dog. Footnote, a story attributed to the Persian poet Nizami, 1141-1203, and adapted by Goethe for inclusion in his West Östlicher Divan. It is translated into English as Agrophon in selected poems, Angelos Sicilanios, Princeton University Press, Princeton, 1979, pages 137 to 139. End footnote. The others all turned away from the ugly sight, but Christ Jesus spoke admiringly of the animal's beautiful teeth. We can practice maintaining the soul attitude toward the world that this legend exemplifies. The erroneous, the bad, and the ugly must not prevent the soul from finding the true, the good, and the beautiful wherever they are present. We must not confuse this positivity with being artificially uncritical or arbitrarily closing our eyes to things that are bad, false, or inferior. It is possible to admire a dead animal's beautiful teeth and still see the decaying corpse. The corpse does not prevent us from seeing the beautiful teeth. We cannot consider bad things good and false things true, but we can reach the point where the bad does not prevent us from seeing the good and errors do not keep us from seeing the truth. 
Our thinking undergoes a certain maturing process in connection with the will when we attempt never to allow anything we have experienced to deprive us of our unbiased receptivity to new experiences. For students of the Spirit, the thought, quote, I've never heard of that, I don't believe it, unquote, should totally lose its meaning. During specific periods of time, we should be intent on using every opportunity to learn something new concerning everything and every being. If we are ready and willing to take previously unaccustomed points of view, we can learn from every current of air, every leaf, every babbling baby. Admittedly, it is easy to go too far with regard to this ability. At any given stage in life, we should not disregard all our previous experiences. We should indeed judge what we are experiencing in the present on the basis of past experiences. This belongs on one side of the scales. On the other, however, students of the Spirit must place their inclination to constantly experience new things and especially their faith in the possibility that new experiences will contradict old ones. We have now listed five soul qualities that students in a genuine spiritual training need to acquire. Control of one's train of thought. Control of one's will impulses. Composure in the face of joy and sorrow. Positivity in judging the world. And receptivity in one's attitude toward life. Having spent certain periods of time practicing these qualities consecutively, we will then need to bring them into harmony with each other in our souls. We will need to practice them in pairs or in combinations of three and one at the same time and so on in order to bring about this harmony. Methods of spiritual training recommend these exercises because if conscientiously carried out they not only have the above-mentioned direct effects on students but also affect them in many indirect ways that they need on their path to the spiritual worlds. If we do these exercises enough, we will encounter many shortcomings and errors in our soul life and will discover the necessary means of strengthening and safeguarding the activity of our intellect, our feelings, and our character. Depending on our abilities, temperament, and character, we will certainly need many other exercises, but these will follow quite naturally from ample practice of the ones described above. In fact, we will notice that these exercises indirectly and gradually supply things that did not initially seem inherent in them. For example, after a certain time, people with too little self-confidence will notice that doing these exercises develops the, the self-confidence they need. The same is true of other soul qualities. Parenthesis, specific and more detailed exercises can be found in my book How to Know Higher Worlds. Parenthesis. <clears throat> it is significant that students of the Spirit are able to advance to ever higher levels of the faculties indicated. They must develop their control of thoughts and feelings to the point where their souls have the power to establish times of complete inner tranquility. During these times, students must keep their hearts and minds free of everything outer daily life brings with it in the way of joy and sorrow, satisfactions and concerns, and even tasks and demands. The only things that are allowed to enter the soul in this state of meditation are what the soul itself chooses to admit. It is easy for a certain prejudice to become apparent with regard to this. People might think that we would estrange ourselves from daily life and its tasks if we withdrew our heart and mind from them for certain periods during the day. In reality, however, this is not the case at all. If we give ourselves up to periods of inner stillness and peace, this engenders many powerful forces that are applicable even to our duties in daily life. As a result, we will not only not be worse at fulfilling our daily obligations, but will certainly be better at it than we were before. It is extremely valuable when people are able to detach themselves completely during these periods from thoughts about their personal concerns and rise to concerns that are shared by all. If they are able to fill their souls 
with communications from the higher spiritual worlds, and if this information is able to capture their interest to the same extent as their personal cares or concerns, this will prove especially fruitful for their souls. If we make an effort to intercede in our soul life and regulate it in this way, we will also find it possible to observe ourselves and our own concerns with the same composure we apply to the concerns of others. Being able to look at our own experiences, joys and sorrows as if they belong to someone else is a good preparation for spiritual training. We can gradually acquire this ability to the necessary extent by taking time after our day's work is done to allow our experiences of the day to pass in front of us in the spirit. We should see ourselves in the images of these experiences. That is, we must look in on ourselves in our daily lives as if from outside. We acquire a certain facility in self-observation of this sort by beginning with visualizations of small isolated portions of our daily life. With practice we become increasingly skillful in doing this retrospective view so that after considerable practice we are able to form a complete picture in a short time. Looking at our experiences in reverse order is especially valuable for spiritual training because it forces us to free our visualizations from our normal habit of merely tracing the course of sense perceptible events with our thinking. In this reversed thinking we visualize things correctly but are not bound by their sense perceptible sequence. This is something we need in order to find our way into the spiritual world. It makes our visualizing stronger in a healthy way. That's why it is also good, in addition to visualizing our daily life in reverse, to do the same with other things, such as the sequence of a drama, a narrative, a melody, and so on. For students of the Spirit, the ideal increasingly becomes to relate to the events they encounter in life with inner certainty and tranquility of soul and to judge them according to their own inherent significance and value rather than on the basis of a personal state of mind. With this ideal in view students are able to create a foundation in their own souls for devoting effort to the above-mentioned meditation exercises on symbolic ideas or other thoughts and feelings. The prerequisites described here must be met because we build up our supersensible experience on the basis of our standing in ordinary soul life before entering the spiritual world. In two different ways everything we experience supersensibly is dependent on the soul's point of departure for entering this world. If we are not concerned from the very beginning with making a healthy faculty of judgment the basis of our spiritual training, we will develop supersensible faculties that perceive the spiritual world inexactly and incorrectly. Our spiritual organs of perception will not develop properly, so to speak. Just as we cannot see properly in the world of the senses if our eyes are defective or diseased, we also cannot perceive properly with spiritual organs that have not been developed on the basis of a healthy faculty of judgment. And if we take an immoral attitude as our point of departure, the way we ascend into the spiritual worlds will make our spiritual view seem clouded or dazed. We will confront supersensible worlds like someone observing the sensory world in a daze. Although in the sensory world such a person will surely not be capable of saying anything significant about that world, even dazed spiritual observers are more awake than people in a normal state of consciousness so their statements become errors with regard to the spiritual world. Inner soundness of the imaginative, imaginative stage of cognition is achieved when the habit of what we might call quote, sense-free thinking unquote, supports the soul meditations described here. If we form a thought on the basis of observing something in the physical world of the senses, this thought is not sense-free. However, such thoughts are not the only ones human beings are capable of having. Our thinking does not necessarily have to become empty and without content simply because we do not allow it to be filled with sensory observations, 
The safest and most obvious way for students of the spirit to learn sense-free thinking is by studying the facts that spiritual science communicate about the higher world and by taking possession of them with their own thinking. Although these facts cannot be observed by our physical senses, we will find that we are able to comprehend them if we have enough patience and persistence. We cannot do research in the higher world or make observations of our own without higher training. But even without it, we can understand everything researchers communicate about this world. There is no reason for anyone to say, how am I supposed to accept on faith what spiritual researchers say since I can't see it for myself? Simply by thinking about it, we can come to the conviction that this information is true. If we can't do this, it's not because it is impossible to believe in something we do not see, but simply because we have applied our thinking, because, let me read that again, but simply because how we have applied our thinking has not yet, has not yet been sufficiently unbiased, comprehensive, and thorough. To come to clarity on this point, we must realize that human thinking, if it gets a strong inner grip on itself, can comprehend much more than we usually imagine it can. There is an inner entity inherent in thought itself that already has connections to the supersensible world. The soul is usually not aware of these connections because it is in the habit of developing its thinking abilities only by applying them to the sensory world. As a result, the soul finds information about the supersensible world incomprehensible. However, this information actually is understandable not only to a spiritually trained way of thinking, but to any thinking that is aware of its full power and is willing to make use of it. By constantly making the statements of spiritual research our own, we become accustomed to thinking in a way that does not draw on sensory observations. We learn to recognize how thoughts interweave within the soul, how one thought seeks out another, even when the connections between them are not brought about by the power of sensory observation. Here, the essential thing is that we become aware of the inner life of the thought world. We become aware that if we are truly thinking, we are already in the domain of a living, supersensible world. We realize that something within us is building up a thought organism and that we ourselves are one with this something. When we give ourselves up to sense-free thinking, we experience that something being-like is flowing into our inner life, just as the characteristics of sense-perceptible things flow into us through our physical organs when we observe by means of our senses. Observers of the sense-perceptible world say to themselves, there is a rose in the space out there and it is not strange to me because it makes itself known through its color and its smell. When sense-free thinking is at work in us, we only need to be sufficiently unbiased to have the corresponding thought, something being-like that links one thought to another within me, forming a thought organism, is making itself known to me. However, there is a difference between the sensations we have of things we observe in the outer sensory world and our sensations of the inherent reality that makes itself known in sense-free thinking. People observing a rose feel that they are observing it from outside, while people devoting themselves to sense-free thinking feel that the inherent reality that is making itself known to them is present within them. They feel one with it. Of course, those who can only bring themselves, either consciously or subconsciously, to acknowledge the existence of things that confront them in the way that external objects do, will not be able to have the feeling that something being-like in character can make itself known through the fact that they feel one with it. In order to see correctly in this connection, we must be able to have this inner experience. We must learn to distinguish the connections between thoughts that we create freely and arbitrarily from the ones we experience within ourselves when we silence our personal arbitrary will. In the case of the latter, we may then acknowledge that while we ourselves are quite still and are not creating any connections between thoughts, we are giving ourselves up to what, quote-unquote, thinks in us. 
We are then as fully justified in saying that something being like in character is working in us as we are in saying that the rose is working on us when we perceive a certain red color or a particular scent. This is not contradicted by the fact that the contents of these particular thoughts of ours have been communicated to us by spiritual researchers. Although these thoughts are already present when we give ourselves up to them, it would be impossible for us to think them without recreating them anew in our souls in each single instance. In any case, the important point here is that when spiritual researchers awaken thoughts in their listeners and readers, these people must first draw these thoughts up out of themselves. In contrast, researchers who describe sense-perceptible realities point to things that their listeners and readers can observe in the world of the senses. Parenthesis. It's a long one, too. The path that leads us to sense-free thinking by means of information conveyed by spiritual science is absolutely reliable. However, there is another one that is even more reliable and, above all, more exact. It is presented in my books Goethe's Worldview and Intuitive Thinking as a Spiritual Path. A footnote, Goethe's Worldview is Mercury Press, Spring Valley, New York, 1985. Intuitive Thinking as a Spiritual Path, a Philosophy of Freedom, Anthroposophic Press, Hudson, New York, 1995. End footnote. These books present the knowledge human thinking can gain when it does not devote itself to the impressions of the external physical world of the senses, but only to itself. What is then at work is not the thinking that indulges only in memories of sense-perceptible things. It is pure thinking, which acts like a living entity within the human being. Although these books include none of the information conveyed by spiritual science, they demonstrate that pure thinking working only within itself is capable of unlocking the secrets of the universe, life, and the human being. These works constitute an important intermediate level between knowing the world of the senses and knowing the spiritual world. They present what thinking can gain by rising above sensory observation while not yet becoming involved in spiritual research. If we allow these books to work on our entire souls, we are already in the spiritual world, but it makes itself known to us as the world of thoughts. People who feel that they are in a position to allow an intermediate stage such as this to work on them are traveling a safe path. It will give them a feeling for the higher world that will bear the most beautiful fruit in all times to come. And parentheses, uh, that's the end of paragraph 33 on page 325. And I'll end this section here. I'm on page 325 of An Outline of Esoteric Science, Chapter 5. This is the third part of Chapter 5 that I've read, that I'm reading. And it begins on paragraph 34. To put it precisely, the goal of meditating on the symbolic mental images and feelings characterized above is to develop higher organs of perception within the human astral body. Initially these organs are created out of the substance of the astral body. They inform us about a new world where we get to know ourselves as new eyes. These new perceptual organs are already different from those of the physical world of the senses in that they are active organs. Eyes and ears passively allow light and sound to work on them, but our perceptual organs of spirit and soul can be said to be constantly active during perception and grasp objects and facts in full consciousness, so to speak. As a result, we experience soul-spiritual cognition as a process of uniting with the facts in question and, quote, dwelling in them, unquote. Metaphorically speaking, these developing individual organs of soul and spirit can be called quote-unquote lotus flowers because this corresponds to the imaginative picture supersensible consciousness has to make of them. Parenthesis, of course, we must realize that this term has nothing more to do with the actual thing in question than the term chamber does when we speak of the chambers of the heart. Parenthesis. Through very specific types of meditation, we work on the astral body in such a way 
that one or the other soul spiritual organ or lotus flower takes shape. After everything that has been described in this book, it should be superfluous to mention that we must not imagine such an organ as something whose reality is reflected by our sensory mental image of it. These organs are supersensible and consist of soul activity that is shaped in a particular way. They exist only inasmuch and as long as this soul activity is being exercised. There is nothing sense perceptible about these organs, just as no vapor is present around a human being who is thinking. We fall into mis misunderstandings if we insist on imagining the supersensible as sense perceptible in any way. Although this remark is quite superfluous, it is inserted here because we repeatedly encounter people who are convinced of the existence of the supersensible, but try to imagine it only as something sense perceptible. We also repeatedly encounter opponents of supersensible cognition, who believe that spiritual researchers are speaking of lotus flowers as if they were talking about delicate sense perceptible formations. Any genuine meditation that is done with regard to imaginative cognition has an effect on one or the other of these organs. Parenthesis details on methods of meditation and exercises that influence specific organs may be found in my book How to Know Higher Worlds. Parenthesis. In any genuine training, the student's individual exercises are set up and arranged in a sequence so that the organs can develop accordingly, either in conjunction with one another or one after the other. This training requires a great deal of patience and persistence on the student's part. The usual amount of patience people acquire as a result of their situation in life is not sufficient, because it often takes a long, long time before these organs have developed enough to be used for perception in the higher world. When this finally happens it can be called enlightenment in contrast to the period of preparation or purification that consists of exercises to develop the organs. Parenthesis, the word purification is used here because these exercises purify a certain part of the student's inner life, eliminating everything that comes exclusively from the world of sensory observation. Parenthesis. It's certainly possible for people who have not yet experienced actual enlightenment to receive repeated flashes of light from a higher world. Even such flashes allow them to bear witness to spiritual worlds and should be accepted with gratitude. But students should not waver if these flashes do not appear during the preparation period, which may seem unduly long. People who are still capable of becoming impatient because they don't see anything yet have not yet acquired the right relationship to the higher world, a relationship understood only by those who are capable of seeing the training exercises as almost an end in themselves. In actual fact, these exercises are working on our soul spiritual nature, that is, on the astral body. Even if we cannot see, we can feel that we are doing soul spiritual work. The only possible reason for not being able to feel this is having a preconceived idea of what we are actually trying to see. In that case we will think nothing of something that is actually immensely significant. However, we must be subtly attentive to all of our experiences while practicing because they are so very different from all of our experiences in the world of the senses. We will then notice that we are not simply making impressions on the astral body as if it were some indifferent substance. There is a whole world in there that is different from the life our senses tell us about. Higher beings work on the astral body in the same way the outer physical world of the senses works on the physical body. We quote-unquote bump into the higher life in our own astral body if we do not close ourselves off to it. But if we repeatedly say to ourselves, quote, I don't perceive anything, unquote, it's usually because we have preconceived ideas of how this perception is supposed to look. Because we are not seeing what we have convinced ourselves we ought to see, we say that we don't see anything. However, once we have the right attitude about doing these training exercises, we will increasingly find something in them that we can love for its own sake. We will realize that the very act of practicing places us in the midst of a world of spirit and soul and we will wait patiently and humbly for what may follow. 
This attitude can best become conscious in us in these words. I will do all the exercises that are suitable for me, knowing that at the right time as much will come to me as is important for me to have. I do not demand this impatiently, but I am constantly preparing to receive it. It is not legitimate to object that students of the Spirit have to grope around in the dark indefinitely because success alone can show them that they are on the right path. It's not true that this is the only way to know that we are doing the right exercises. If we take the right approach to our exercises, the satisfaction we gain will make it clear that we are doing the right thing. We do not have to wait for success to have this certainty. Appropriate practice in the field of spiritual training goes hand in hand with a satisfaction that is more than just satisfaction. It is also knowledge. The knowledge of being able to see that what we are doing is leading us in the right direction. We can have this knowledge at any time if we pay attention to the subtleties of what we are experiencing. If we do not, this experience escapes us and we pass it by like hikers, lost in thought who fail to see the trees on either side of the trail, although they would be able to see them if they simply paid attention to them. Success invariably does come if we continue to practice. And it is not at all desirable to force results to appear more quickly. If we did, the result might be only a small part of what actually should have appeared. With regard to spiritual development, Partial success is often the reason for a great delay in achieving complete success. Moving among the forms of spiritual life that constitute partial success dulls us to the influences of forces that can lead to higher levels of development. We only appear to have gained something by having quote-unquote seen into the spiritual world because seeing it in this way gives us deceptive images instead of truth. As the soul's spiritual organs, or lotus flowers, take shape, they appear to supersensible consciousness to be located close to certain organs in the physical body of the person undergoing training. Of these soul organs, we may mention the following. The so-called two-petaled lotus flower that we feel as if between the eyebrows. The sixteen-petaled lotus flower in the area of the larynx. The twelve-petaled lotus flower in the area of the heart, and a fourth that is located near the solar plexus. Other such organs appear in the vicinity of other parts of the physical body. <coughs> Parenthesis, the names two-petaled or sixteen-petaled can be used because the organs in question can be compared to flowers with a corresponding number of petals. Parenthesis. We become conscious of the lotus flowers through the astral body. As soon as we have developed one or the other of these organs, we are also aware that we have it. We feel that we are able to make use of it and that in doing so we are actually entering a higher world. In many respects, our impressions of this world are still similar to impressions of the physical world of the senses. People with imaginative cognition will be able to speak of this new higher world in terms of sensations of warmth or cold, perceptions of sounds and words, and impressions of light or color because that is how they experience it. However, they are aware that these perceptions express something different in the imaginative world than they do in the world of sense-perceptible reality. They realize that the senses underlying them are soul-spiritual rather than physical-material ones. If they receive something like an impression of warmth, they do not attribute it to a piece of hot iron, for example, but think of it as emanating from a soul process similar to the ones they had, until, until now, been familiar with only in their own soul life. They know that soul spiritual things and processes stand behind these imaginative perceptions, just as material, physical beings and realities stand behind physical perceptions. Alongside the similarity between the imaginative and physical worlds, however, there is also a significant difference. One thing that is present in the physical world appears quite differently in the imaginative world. In the physical world we can observe things constantly coming into existence and disappearing again. There is a constant alternation between birth and death. In the imaginative world this phenomenon is replaced by the constant transformation of one thing into another. 
For example, in the physical world we see a plant die and decompose. In the imaginative world, another configuration that is visibly, excuse me, that is physically imperceptible comes about as the plant withers away. The decaying plant is gradually transformed into this other configuration. Once the plant has completely disappeared, this figure has developed fully and taken its place. Birth and death are ideas that lose their significance in the imaginative world. They are replaced by the concept of one thing being transformed into another. Because of this, certain truths about our human makeup become accessible to imaginative cognition. These truths are the ones presented in Chapter 2 of this book. As far as physical sensory perception is concerned, only the processes of the physical body are perceptible. These are played out in the domain of birth and death. The other members of our human makeup, the life body, the sentient body, and the eye, are subject to the laws of transformation and are perceptible to imaginative cognition. Anyone who has advanced to this stage perceives how something that goes on living after death in another state of existence releases itself, so to speak, from the physical body at death. However, inner development does not stop at the level of the imaginative world. If we chose to stop here, we would perceive beings who are undergoing processes of transformation, but we would not be able to interpret these processes, nor would we be able to orient ourselves in this newly won world. The imaginative world is a restless region, full of movement and transformation. There are no resting places in it. We reach such resting places only by developing beyond the level of imaginative cognition to what can be called cognition through inspiration. It is not necessary for those seeking knowledge about the supersensible world to acquire the faculty of imaginative cognition to its fullest extent before moving on to inspiration. Their exercises may be arranged so that what leads to imagination develops parallel to what leads to inspiration. After the appropriate amount of time, these students will enter a higher world where, in addition to being able to perceive, they will also be able to orient themselves and interpret what they see. Typically, however, they first perceive some of the phenomena of the imaginative world and only later feel that they are gaining the ability to orient themselves. Compared to the world of mere imagination, however, the world of inspiration is something totally new. Through imagination we perceive the transformation of one process into another, but through inspiration we become familiar with the inner qualities of the beings who are undergoing transformation. Through imagination we recognize the sole expression of these beings, but through inspiration we penetrate their inner spiritual nature. Above all, we recognize a multitude of spiritual beings and the relationships between them. In the physical world of the senses, we are also dealing with a multitude of different beings, but the multitude in the world of inspiration is different in character. There, each being's very specific relationships to others are determined by its inner makeup rather than by external influences, as is the case in the physical world. When we perceive a being in the world of inspiration, we do not perceive any outer effect it might have on another, that is, any effect comparable to how physical beings affect each other. Instead, the relationship between beings comes about through how they are each inwardly constituted. In the physical world, this relationship can be compared to the relationship between individual sounds or letters in a word. Let's take the word human. It is brought about by the combined sounding of the speech sounds, H-U-M-A-N. Although there is no impetus or other external influence connecting the H to the U, the two sounds work together within the totality because of how they are inwardly constituted. For this reason, observing the world of inspiration can only be compared to reading, and beings in this world are like letters of the alphabet in how they affect observers. We must become familiar with these letters and decipher their interrelationships like supersensible writing. This is why spiritual science also calls cognition through inspiration, quote, reading the hidden script, unquote. 
how this hidden script is read and how what has been read can be communicated will now be made clear using previous chapters of this book as examples. The first thing described was how the makeup of the human being consists of different components. Next, it was shown how the cosmic body on which human beings evolve has passed through various conditions during the Saturn, Sun, Moon, and Earth phases of evolution. The perceptions that allow us to recognize the members of our human makeup, on the one hand, and the Earth's successive stages and earlier metamorphoses on the other, are perceptible to imaginative cognition. However, it is also necessary to recognize the connections that exist between the Saturn state and the physical human body, the Sun state and the ether body, and so on. It must be possible to demonstrate that the seminal nucleus of the physical human body came about already during the Saturn state, and that it then continued to evolve during the Sun, Moon, and Earth states until it reached its present form. For example, it was necessary to show what changes took place in the human being as a result of the separation of the sun from the earth, and that something similar happened in relation to the moon. It was also necessary to describe the interactions that were needed for the transformations in humanity that occurred during the Atlantean age and the successive periods of the Indian, Persian, and Egyptian cultures, and so on. Depicting these connections does not result from imaginative perception, but from cognition through inspiration, from reading the hidden script in which imaginative perceptions are like letters or sounds. This sort of reading, however, is needed for other things, in addition to explaining what has been described above. We would not be able to understand the whole course of a human life if we were able to look at it only through imaginative cognition. If we were not able to orient ourselves within our imaginative perceptions, we would perceive how the soul-spiritual members are released from what remains behind in the physical world at death, but we would not understand the connections between what happens after a person's death and the states that precede and follow. Without cognition through inspiration, the imaginative world would remain like writing that we stare at without being able to read. When we advance from imagination to inspiration as students of the Spirit, it becomes evident very quickly how wrong it would be to renounce understanding the great phenomena of the cosmos and to attempt to restrict ourselves only to facts that touch upon immediate human interests, so to speak. Those who are not initiated into these things might well say, quote, it seems to me that the only important thing is to find out what the fate of the human soul is after death. If someone tells me about that, that's enough. Why does spiritual science tell me about distant things like the Saturn and Sun states and the separation of the Sun and the Moon from the Earth? However, if we have been introduced to these things in the right way, we realize that we can never really know what we want to know if we do not also know about these other things that seem so unnecessary. Any description of the human condition after death will remain completely incomprehensible and worthless if we cannot link it to concepts derived from those distant things. Even the simplest supersensible observation makes it necessary to know about such things. For example, when a plant passes from the flowering stage to the fruiting stage, supersensible observers see a transformation taking place in an astral entity that covers and surrounds the flowering plant like a cloud coming from above. If fertilization did not take place, this astral entity would metamorphose into a form quite different from the one it assumes as a result of fertilization. We can understand this whole process as supersensible observation perceives it if we have learned to understand its nature from the great cosmic process undergone by the earth and all its inhabitants at the time when the sun separated from the earth. Before fertilization, the plant's situation is like that of the whole earth prior to the sun's detachment. After fertilization, the plant's flower resembles the earth when the moon forces were still active in it after the sun had detached itself. If we have personally acquired the ideas that can be gained from studying the sun's detachment, we will then objectively perceive the meaning of the process of fertilization in the plant. We will say that the plant is in a sun state before fertilization and in a moon state afterward. Even the very smallest processes in the world 
can only be understood if we see them as copies of great cosmic processes. Otherwise their nature remains just as incomprehensible as Raphael's Madonna would be to someone who saw only a little speck of blue because the rest of the picture was covered up. Everything that is now happening in the human being is a copy of all the great cosmic processes that have to do with our existence. If we want to understand what supersensible consciousness observes about phenomena taking place between birth and death and those taking place between death and a new birth, we will be able to do so if we have acquired the ability to decipher imaginative observations by means of concepts acquired from the study of macrocosmic processes. This study provides us with the key for understanding human life. This is why, in the sense of spiritual science, we are also observing the human being when we observe the Saturn, Sun, and Moon states. Through inspiration, we acquire the ability to recognize the relationships between beings in the higher world. The next higher stage of cognition makes it possible to recognize the actual inner nature of these beings. This level of cognition can be called intuitive cognition. Parenthesis, the word intuition is misused in everyday life to mean an indefinite, uncertain insight into something, although it may, be, it may coincide at times with the truth. We cannot prove that this sudden insight is justifiable. What is meant here, of course, has nothing to do with an intuition, in quotes of that sort. Here the term intuition is used to designate a cognitive process of the highest degree of light-filled clarity. If we have it, we are fully conscious of its justification. Parenthesis. To have knowledge of a sense-perceptible being means to stand outside it and assess it according to external impressions. To have knowledge of a spiritual being through intuition means having become completely at one with it, having united with its inner nature. Students of the Spirit rise to this level of knowledge step by step. Imagination brings us to the point where we no longer feel that perceptions are external qualities of beings. Instead, we recognize in them the emanations of something that is soul-spiritual in character. Inspiration leads us still further into the inner nature of beings and teaches us to understand what these beings are for each other. In intuition, we penetrate into the beings themselves. Here, too, we can use the accounts in this book to demonstrate the significance of intuition. The preceding chapter not only told how development proceeded to the Saturn, Sun, and Moon phases of evolution and so on, it also informed us that beings were involved in this development in a great variety of ways. The thrones or spirits of will, the spirits of wisdom, the spirits of movement, and others were all introduced. In the earth phase of evolution, the Luciferic and Aramonic spirits, spirits were mentioned. The structure of the cosmos was traced back to the beings involved in it. We can learn about these things through intuitive cognition, something we already feel if we want to understand even the course of a human life. In the time after death, what has freed itself from the physical bodily aspect of the human being passes through various states. Imaginative cognition would still be more or less able to describe the states immediately following death. However, what happens when a human being advances further into the period between death and a new birth would remain totally incomprehensible to imagination if inspiration were not added to it. Only inspiration is able to discover what can be said about human life after purification in the land of spirits. However, inspiration is no longer adequate for the next stage. It loses the thread of understanding at this point, so to speak. There is a period in human development between death and a new birth when the human being is accessible only to intuition. However, this part of the human being is always within us and if we want to understand it in its true inner nature, we must also use intuition to seek it out in the time between birth and death. If we attempted to understand the human being exclusively by means of imagination and inspiration, the processes that belong to this innermost being and play from one incarnation into the next would elude us. Therefore only intuitive cognition makes it possible for us to objectively investigate repeated earthly lives and karma.
All the truths that can be communicated about these processes must result from research that makes use of intuitive cognition. Knowledge of the inner being within us can also come only from intuition. Through intuition, we perceive the aspect of ourselves that progresses from one earthly life to another. Exercises for the soul and spirit are the only way we can achieve the knowledge that comes from inspiration and intuition. These exercises are similar to the contemplations or meditations described for acquiring imagination. However, while these exercises that lead to imagination are linked to impressions of the physical world of the senses, this link must increasingly disappear in exercises that lead to inspiration. To clarify what has to happen, let's think again about the symbol of the Rose Cross. By immersing ourselves in it, we have an image before us whose components are taken from impressions of the sensory world, the black color of the cross, the roses, and so on. However, the way these components are combined into the Rose Cross is not derived from the physical world of the senses. If we attempt to eliminate the black cross and red roses from our consciousness as images of sensory realities and retain in our souls only the spiritual activity that combined them, then we have a means of meditation that will gradually lead to inspiration. Within our souls we should ask, what have I done inwardly in order to combine the cross and roses into this symbol? I want to hold fast to what I have done, to the personal soul process I have undergone, but to allow the image itself to disappear from my consciousness. I will feel everything within me that my soul did in order to bring the image about, but I will not picture the image itself. From this point onward I will dwell quite inwardly in the activity of mine that created the image. Instead of meditating on an image, I will become absorbed in my own image-creating soul activity. Such absorption, if carried out repeatedly with regard to many symbols, will lead to cognition through inspiration. Here is another example. We meditate on the mental image of a plant that first grows and then decays. We allow an image to come about in our souls of a gradually developing plant as it emerges from the seed as one leaf after another unfolds, as flowers and fruit develop. Then we picture how the plant begins to wilt. We follow this process to the point of complete dissolution. As we meditate on this image, we gradually arrive at a feeling of becoming and decaying, for which the plant is only an image. When we persevere at this exercise, this feeling develops into an imagination of the process of transformation that underlies physical becoming and decay. However, if we want to achieve the corresponding inspiration, we must do the exercise differently. We must reflect on the actual soul activity that derived the idea of becoming and decay from the image of the plant. We must allow the plant to disappear completely from our consciousness and meditate only on our own inner activity. Only exercises of this sort make it possible to rise to the level of inspiration. Initially it will not be easy to get a thorough grasp of how to approach such an exercise, because if we are in the habit of allowing our inner life to be determined by outer impressions, we immediately become uncertain and start to vacillate when we have to develop another soul life that has cast off all its connections to these outer impressions. To an even greater degree than in acquiring imaginations, it must be clear to us that we should only undertake exercises that lead to inspiration if we are willing to accompany them with all the precautionary measures that will safeguard and solidify our power of judgment, our feeling life, and our character. Taking these precautions has two results. First, our personalities will not become unbalanced during supersensible perception. Second, we will acquire the ability to really carry out what these exercises demand of us. We will find these exercises difficult only as long as we have not acquired a certain very specific soul makeup, very specific feelings and sensations. 
If we patiently and persistently cultivate inner faculties in our souls that favor the growth of supersensible cognition, we will soon acquire not only an understanding of these exercises, but also the ability to actually do them. We will gain much by acquiring a habit of often withdrawing into ourselves in a way that is less concerned with brooding about ourselves than with quietly organizing and digesting our experiences in life. We will find that our ideas and feelings are enriched by bringing one experience into relationship with another. We will become aware to what a great extent we experience new things, not only by having new impressions and encounters, but also by allowing the old ones to work in us. If we begin to allow the experiences and even the opinions we have acquired to interact as if we ourselves, with all our sympathies and antipathies and personal interests and feelings, were not even present, we will prepare the ground well for the forces of supersensible cognition. We will truly develop what we can call a rich inner life. However, the most important thing in this regard is the stability and balance of our soul qualities. In devoting ourselves to a certain soul activity, we tend to fall into one-sidedness all too easily. As a result, if we once become aware of the advantages of inner reflection and dwelling in our own world of ideas, we may develop such an inclination toward this that we increasingly shut ourselves off from the impressions of the outer world. This, however, makes our inner life dry and desolate. We will go the farthest if alongside the ability to retreat into ourselves we preserve our open receptivity to all impressions of the outer world. This does not apply only to life's so-called important impressions. Any individual in any situation, even in the most miserable surroundings, can experience enough simply by remaining open and receptive. We do not need to go looking for experiences. They are everywhere. It is also especially important how we transform these experiences in our souls. For example, we might make the discovery that someone we or others greatly admire has a certain character trait we would have to consider a shortcoming. This experience can lead our thinking in one of two directions. We could simply say, now that I've realized this, I can no longer respect this person the way I used to. Or we could ask ourselves, how is it possible for this respected person to be afflicted with this particular fault? What must I do to imagine this fault not only as a shortcoming, but as something caused by this person's life or perhaps even by his or her great qualities? If we were to ask ourselves these questions, we might come to the conclusion that our respect is in no way diminished by having observed this shortcoming. Every time we come to such a conclusion, we learn something and increase our understanding of life. Now it would certainly be a bad thing if the merits of this way of looking at life were to mislead us into excusing everything possible in people or things that have our sympathy, or if we were to acquire a habit of disregarding everything that deserves criticism on the grounds that doing so is advantageous for our inner development. This is not the case when the impulse not only to censure but also to understand the faults comes from our own motivations. However, it is advantageous if the instance at hand elicits this attitude, regardless of whether we who judge stand to gain or lose by it. It is absolutely correct that we cannot learn by condemning a fault, but only by understanding it. However, if we want to exclude disapproval entirely for the sake of understanding, we will not get far either. Once again, the important thing is stability and balance in our soul forces, not one-sidedness in one direction or another. This is particularly true of one soul quality that is exceptionally significant for individual development, namely the feeling we call reverence or devotion. This feeling, whether we develop it, develop it in ourselves or already possess it as a fortunate gift of nature, forms an excellent basis for supersensible powers of cognition. Being able to look up to certain people in our childhood and youth with devoted admiration in the same way that we would look up to high ideals means that supersensible cognition will find fertile ground in our souls where it can thrive. Later on in life, when our judgment has matured, if we look up at the starry heavens and sense the revelation of higher powers with complete devotion and admiration, 
we are preparing ourselves for knowledge of supersensible worlds. And this is also true when we are able to appreciate the forces that prevail in human life. It is of no little significance if as adults we are still able to have the highest degree of reverence for other people whose worth we surmise or believe to recognize. Only when such reverence is present can a view into the higher worlds open up. If we are not capable of reverence, we will never advance very far in our knowledge. If we do not want to acknowledge the worth of anything in the world, the essence of things will remain closed to us. In contrast, however, if our feelings of reverence and devotion tempt us to totally kill off our healthy self-awareness and self-confidence, we sin against the law of soul stability and balance. Students of the Spirit will work on themselves continually to make themselves ever more mature. But when they do so, they are also permitted to be confident in their individual personalities and in their continuing growth. If we achieve the right feelings along these lines, we will say to ourselves, there are latent forces within me and I am capable of bringing them up out of my inner being. Therefore, wherever I see something I must honor because it is superior to me, not only must I honor it, but I may also trust myself to develop everything within me that will make me similar to it. The greater our ability to be attentive to certain processes in life that are not immediately familiar to our personal judgment, the greater the possibility of laying the foundations for leading our development into the spiritual worlds. An example may illustrate this. Individuals may find themselves in a situation in life where they can either do something or leave it undone. The judgment says do it, but there is still a certain inexplicable something in their feelings that keeps them from doing whatever it is. They can choose to pay no attention to this inexplicable something and simply do whatever their powers of judgment suggest. However, they can also give in to the urging of the inexplicable and refrain from going through with the action in question. If they then follow up the matter further, it may become evident that the results would have been disastrous if they had followed their judgment and that it was a blessing that they refrained from that particular action. An experience like this can guide our thinking in a very specific direction, allowing us to recognize that there is something in us that guides us better than the degree of judgment we possess at present. We need to be open-minded about this something within us, which we are not mature enough to reach through our faculty of judgment. It is of the greatest possible benefit for the soul to pay attention to such instances in life because they provide a healthy premonition that there is more in us than we can survey with our power of judgment at any given time. Such attentiveness works to expand our soul life. Once again, however, it is also possible for serious one-sidedness to result. If we got into the habit of always disregarding our judgment because of premonitions, impelling us to do this or that, we might become the playthings of all sorts of undefined urges. It is a short step from a habit of this sort to lack of judgment and superstition. For students of the Spirit, superstition of any sort is disastrous. It becomes possible for us to truly make our way into the domains of spiritual life only if we carefully guard ourselves against superstition, fantastic ideas and daydreaming. We do not enter the spiritual world in the right way if we rejoice at every opportunity to experience something quote, that cannot be grasped by the human mind. Unquote. A preference for the inexplicable certainly does not make anyone a student of the Spirit. We must break ourselves of the biased habit of thinking that mystics are those who quote, assume the existence of the inexplicable and the unfathomable unquote, wherever they please. For students of the Spirit, the appropriate attitude is to acknowledge the presence of hidden forces and beings everywhere, but also to assume that the unfathomable can be successfully investigated if the necessary forces are available. A certain soul disposition is important to students of the spirit at every level of development, and it consists not in expressing their desire for knowledge in a one-sided way, constantly asking how one question or another may be answered, but by asking how they can develop certain faculties. Once these faculties have developed through patient inner work, the answers to these questions appear by themselves. 
students of the Spirit will always cultivate this soul disposition in themselves. This leads them to constantly work on themselves, to make themselves ever more, ever more mature, and to relinquish the desire to force answers to certain questions. They will wait until such answers come to them. Once again, if we become one-sided in this respect, we will not make much progress. At certain times, students of the Spirit can also have the feeling that they themselves are able to answer the most exalted questions with the forces currently at their disposal. Here too, steadiness and balance in our soul disposition play an important role. It is helpful to cultivate and develop many more soul qualities if we are attempting to achieve inspiration through doing such exercises. Each of these qualities could be described individually but in each case it would have to be emphasized that steadiness and balance are the all-important soul qualities. They prepare us to understand and to be able to carry out the exercises that have been described as necessary for achieving inspiration. The exercises for achieving intuition require students of the Spirit to extinguish from consciousness not only the images to which they devoted themselves in attaining imagination but also the life of their own soul activity, which they contemplated in acquiring inspiration. Literally, nothing must remain in their souls from any previously known outer or inner experiences. However, if there were nothing in their consciousness after discarding these experiences, that is, if their consciousness disappeared and they sank into unconsciousness, they would realize that they had not yet matured enough to be able to undertake exercises to develop intuition and they would have to continue the exercises for imagination and inspiration. Eventually, however, there comes a time when our consciousness is not empty when the soul casts off its inner and outer experiences, but something remains as an effect. It then becomes possible for us to give ourselves up to this effect, just as we previously gave ourselves up to something that owed its existence to outer or inner impressions. This residual effect is nevertheless very specific in character. In comparison to all our previous experiences, it is something really new. When we experience it, we know that this is something we are not familiar with before, we were not familiar with before. It is a perception, just as actual sound is a perception when our ears hear it. This new perception, however, is something that can only enter our consciousness through intuition just as sound can only enter our consciousness through our ears. Intuition strips our impressions of their last sensory physical remnants and the spiritual world begins to be apparent to our cognition in a form that no longer has anything in common with the characteristics of the physical world of the senses. That is the end of paragraph 46 on page 349. I will be finishing chapter 5 uh, in the next section that I read. This is the end of the third section of chapter 5 in the reading. This is a reading of an outline of esoteric science. It is the fourth part of chapter 5. I am beginning on page 349 with paragraph 47. Imaginative cognition is achieved when the lotus flowers develop out of the astral body. Through the exercises we undertake in order to reach inspiration and intuition, specific movements, configurations and currents that were not there before appear in our ether body or life body. These are the organs that allow us to acquire the ability to read the hidden script and what lies beyond it. The changes in the ether body of a person who has achieved inspiration and intuition present themselves to supersensible cognition as follows. A new center in the ether body, located approximately in the area of the physical heart, becomes conscious and develops into an etheric organ. A great variety of movements and currents run from it to the various parts of the human body. The most important of these currents go to the lotus flowers, permeating them and their individual petals and then pour out like rays into external space. The more highly developed the person in question, the larger the surrounding area where these currents are perceptible. In a genuine training, however, this center 
in the area of the heart does not develop immediately. First, the way is prepared for it. A temporary center appears in the head, which then slips down to the vicinity of the larynx and then moves into the area of the physical heart. In an abnormal development, the organ in question might form immediately in the vicinity of the heart. In this case, instead of achieving supersensible perception calmly and objectively, the person in question would be in danger of becoming a visionary and a fanatic. As students of the spirit develop further, they learn how to take the currents and differentiations that have developed in the ether body, make them independent of the physical body, and use them independently. In this process the lotus flowers are used as tools for moving the ether body. Before this can happen, however, certain currents and rays must have formed all around the ether body, closing it off as if in a delicate network and making it a self-contained entity. Once this has happened, nothing hinders the movements and currents taking place in the ether body from coming into contact with the external world of soul and spirit, so that outer soul spiritual events and inner ones taking place in the human ether body intermingle. At this point such a person consciously perceives the world of inspiration. Cognition of this sort does not appear in the same way as the cognition that applies to the physical world of the senses. In the sensory world we receive perceptions through our senses and then form mental images and concepts about them. This is not the case when we know about something through inspiration. What we know there is immediately present in a single action. There is no such thing as thinking about a perception after it occurs. In inspiration, what we acquire in the form of a concept after the fact in sensory physical cognition is presented simultaneously with the perception. This is why we should flow into and merge with the surrounding world of soul and spirit and be unable to distinguish ourselves from it if we had not developed the network in the ether body that has just been described. When we do the exercises that lead to intuition, they do not only affect the ether body but also work into the supersensible forces of the physical body. We must not imagine, however, that the effects within the physical body are accessible to our ordinary sense perception. They can only be assessed by means of supersensible cognition and have nothing to do with external cognition. They are a result of consciousness maturing to the point where it is able to have intuitive experiences even after having excluded all previous outer and inner experiences. Intuitive experiences, however, are tender, subtle, and delicate. At its present stage of evolution, the physical human body is coarse in comparison to them and presents a major obstacle to the success of intuition exercises. But if these exercises are carried out with energy, persistence, and the necessary inner tranquility, they eventually overcome the mighty obstacles presented by the physical body. Students of the spirit notice that this has happened when they gain control over certain expressions of the physical body that formerly occurred completely unconsciously. They may notice it also because they feel the need to regulate their breathing, for example, for short periods of time, so that it harmonizes with what their souls are doing in these exercises or other meditations. In inner development, the ideal is not to perform any exercises, including breathing exercises of this sort, by means of the physical body itself. Instead, everything that needs to happen with regard to the physical body should come about only as a consequence of pure intuition exercises. At a certain level, in their ascent along the path to worlds of higher cognition, students of the spirit notice that the forces of their personalities are being held together differently than they are in the physical world of the senses. In the physical world, the I makes the soul forces of thinking, feeling, and willing work together in a unified way. Under the ordinary circumstances of our lives, these three soul forces always relate to each other in specific ways. For example, we see something in the outer world and our souls like it or dislike it.
that is, the mental image of the thing, is necessarily followed by a feeling of liking or disliking. We may desire the thing in question or have an impulse to change it in one way or another. This means that our will and our ability to desire something are associated with an idea and a feeling. This happens because the eye unites visualizing, thinking, feeling and willing, thus bringing order into the forces of the personality. This healthy order would be disrupted if the eye were to prove powerless in this respect, if our desires wanted to take a different direction from our feeling or thinking, for example. Thinking that a certain thing is right while wanting to do something that we do not think is right or wanting what we dislike instead of what we like would not indicate a healthy state of mind. On the path toward higher cognition, however, we actually notice that thinking, feeling and willing separate and acquire a certain independence from each other. For example, that certain thoughts no longer seem to automatically impel us toward a specific way of feeling and willing. At this point, although in thinking we can perceive something correctly, we again require an independent impulse coming from ourselves in order to come to any feeling or willed decision about it. During supersensible observation, thinking, feeling and willing do not remain three forces radiating from their common center in the eye of the person in question. They become independent beings, three separate personalities, so to speak. The individual I must become that much stronger because rather than simply having to impose order on three forces, it must now guide and direct three beings. This separation, however, should persist only as long as supersensible observation continues. Here again it becomes apparent how important it is for exercises leading to higher training to be accompanied by ones that provide stability and firmness for our capacity for judgment and our life of feeling and will. If we do not bring these qualities with us into the higher world, we will soon see that the eye proves too weak to act as an appropriate guide for thinking, feeling and willing. In this case the soul is torn apart in different directions by three personalities, so to speak, and its inner unity comes to an end. But if a student's development proceeds in the right way, the transformation of these forces signifies true progress and the eye retains its mastery over the independent beings that now make up the soul. In the further course of personal development, this evolution continues. Thinking, having become independent, stimulates the appearance of a fourth specific soul-spiritual being that can be described as a direct influx of thought-like currents into the human being. The entire cosmos then appears as a thought structure that confronts us just as the world of plants or animals confronts us in the physical domain of the senses. Similarly, our newly independent feeling and willing stimulate two forces in the soul that also act like independent beings within it. Still a seventh force and being appears, which is similar to our own I. This whole experience is linked to another one. Before entering the supersensible world, we know our thinking, feeling and willing only as inner soul experiences. As soon as we enter this world, we perceive things that express the element of soul and spirit rather than the physical sensory element. There are now beings of soul and spirit standing behind the perceived qualities of this new world and presenting themselves to us as an outer world in the same way that stones, plants and animals pre present themselves to our senses in the physical domain. Students of the spirit can perceive a significant difference between the world that is now disclosing itself to them and the one they are accustomed to perceiving with their senses. A plant in the world of the senses remains the same regardless of what the human soul feels or thinks about it. Initially this is not the case with the images of the world of soul and spirit. They change according to what we feel or think. We imprint a certain character on them in accordance with our own essence. Let's imagine that a certain image appears in the imaginative world in front of us. It shows itself in one form if our souls remain indifferent to it. 
But as soon as we experience liking or disliking with regard to this image, it changes its form. To begin with, therefore, these images not only express something independent of and external to us, but also reflect what we are. They are thoroughly permeated with our own human essence, which is drawn over the beings in question like a veil. Even when we are confronted by a real being, we see something of our own creation instead of the being itself. We can actually have something totally true in front of us and still see something false. And this is not only the case with regard to the aspects of our essential nature that we actually notice in ourselves, but everything else in us also influences this world in the same way. For example, we may have hidden tendencies that do not become evident in our life because of our education and character, but they do influence the world of spirit and soul, which assumes a particular coloration as a result of the total being of each one of us, regardless of how much we ourselves know or do not know about this essential being. To advance beyond this level of development, we must learn to distinguish between ourselves and the spiritual outer world. We must learn to exclude all the effects of the individual self on the world of soul and spirit around us. The only way we can do this is by knowing about what we ourselves bring into this new world. The important thing, therefore, is that we must first have a true and thorough knowledge of ourselves so that we can perceive the surrounding world of soul and spirit in a pure way. It is inherent in certain facts of human inner, inner development that knowing ourselves in this way takes place quite naturally and as a matter of necessity when we enter the higher world. As we know, we each develop our I, our self-awareness, in the ordinary physical world of the senses. This I now acts as a center of attraction for everything that belongs to the human individual. All our inclinations, sympathies, antipathies, passions, opinions, and so on gather around this I, as it were, which is also the point of attraction for everything we call an individual's karma. If we were to see this I exposed, we would recognize its need to encounter specific forms of destiny in this and subsequent incarnations, according to how it lived in earlier incarnations and what it acquired there. With all of this clinging to it, the I is necessarily the first image that appears to the human soul ascending into the world of soul and spirit. According to a law of the spiritual world, this double of ours must be the very first impression we receive there. This underlying law becomes easily understandable if we consider the following. In our physical sensory life we perceive ourselves only to the extent that we have inner experiences of ourselves in our thinking, feeling and willing. However, these perceptions are inner ones that do not present themselves to us in the same way that stones, plants and animals present themselves. In addition, we also become only partially familiar with ourselves through inner perception because something within us prevents deeper self-knowledge. What prevents this is an impulse to immediately transform any character trait if self-knowledge forces us to acknowledge it and we do not want to succumb to self-deception. If we do not give in to this impulse, if we simply divert our attention from this aspect of ourselves and remain the way we are, we deprive ourselves of the possibility of getting to know ourselves on this particular point. But if we de delve into ourselves and hold up certain character traits for inspection without deceiving ourselves, either we will be in a position to correct them or we will be unable to do so in our present situation. In this latter instance, a feeling that we must describe as shame creeps into our souls. This is how healthy human nature actually works. It experiences many different types of shame in the process of self-knowledge. Now, this feeling already has a very specific effect, even in our ordinary life. People with sound thinking will make sure that the aspects of themselves that give them this feeling have no outer effects, that they are not played out in outer actions. Shame, therefore, is a force that impels us to conceal something within us and not allow it to become outwardly perceptible. If we give this due consideration, we will understand why spiritual research ascribes much more wide-ranging effects 
to an inner soul experience that is very closely related to the feeling of shame. This research reveals a type of hidden shame in the hidden depths of the soul, a shame that we do not become conscious of in our physical, sensory life. However, this hidden feeling works in a way that is similar to how the ordinary feeling of shame works in everyday life. It prevents a person's innermost being from appearing to that person as a perceptible image. If this feeling were not there, we would confront a perception of what we are in truth. We would not only have inner experiences of our ideas, feelings and will, we would also perceive them just as we perceive stones, animals and plants. This feeling conceals us from ourselves, and at the same time it conceals the entire world of soul and spirit, because the fact that our own inner being is concealed from us means that we are also unable to perceive the means of developing tools for recognizing the world of soul and spirit. We are unable to transform our own being to receive the organs of spiritual perception. However, if we work toward acquiring these organs through genuine training, the first impression that appears to us is an impression of what we ourselves are. We each perceive our own double. This self-perception cannot be separated from perceiving the rest of the world of soul and spirit. In ordinary life, in the physical sensory world, the effect of the feeling described above is that it constantly closes the door of the soul spiritual world in our faces. If we want to take even a single step toward entering this world, this subconscious feeling of shame immediately appears and conceals the part of the world of soul and spirit that wants to become evident. The exercises that were described earlier, however, open this world to us. And in fact, this concealed feeling acts like a great benefactor of human beings, because any powers of judgment, feeling, life or character we acquire without spiritual scientific training do not make us capable of standing up to the perception of our own nature in its true form without further preparation. Perceiving this would deprive us of all of our self-esteem, self-confidence and self-awareness. We need to take precautionary measures in cultivating our sound judgment, feeling life and character in addition to doing the exercises for higher knowledge in order to ensure that this does not happen. Through proper training we learn as if unintentionally enough spiritual science and the necessary means of self-knowledge and self-observation to have sufficient strength to encounter our double. For students of the spirit it is then like seeing what they have, have already learned in the physical world in another form as a picture of the imaginative world. If we have already acquired a rational grasp of the law of karma in the physical world, we will not be unduly shaken by seeing the seeds of our destiny imprinted on the image of our double. If we have used our powers of judgment to become familiar with the evolution of the cosmos and of humankind, and if we know that at a certain point in this evolution the forces of Lucifer invaded the human soul, it will not be difficult for us to bear it when we become aware that Luciferic beings and all their influences are contained in this image of our own essential nature. We see from this how necessary it is that we not demand to enter the spiritual world ourselves before we have understood certain truths about this world through the ordinary powers of judgment that we develop in the physical world of the senses. Before wanting to actually enter the supersensible worlds, students of the spirit should make their own the information in this book that precedes the discussion of knowing higher worlds. In the course of a legitimate self-development process, they should do this on the basis of their ordinary powers of judgment. In a training that does not pay attention to safeguarding and solidifying the power of judgment, their life of feeling and their character, it could happen that the higher world would approach the students before they have the necessary inner faculties. If this happened, encountering their doubles would depress them and lead them into errors. If, however, human beings avoided this encounter entirely and were nevertheless led into the supersensible world, which would also be possible, they would be equally incapable of recognizing this world in its true form. It would be totally impossible for them to distinguish between what they themselves were projecting onto things 
and what these things really were. It is only possible to make this distinction if we perceive our own essence as an image in itself. If we do so, everything flowing from our own inner nature detaches itself from what surrounds it. In our life in the physical world of the senses, the double immediately makes itself invisible by means of the sense of shame described above when we approach the world of soul and spirit. Simultaneously, however, the double also conceals this entire world. It stands like a guardian in front of that world, refusing entry to anyone not yet suitable for entering. The double can, therefore, be called, quote, the guardian of the threshold to the world of soul and spirit, unquote. We encounter this guardian of the threshold not only when we enter the supersensible world in the way described, but also when we enter it through physical death. The guardian reveals itself gradually in the course of our soul's spiritual development between death and a new birth. In this case, however, we are not oppressed by this encounter because we know about worlds we did not know about during life between birth and death. If we were to enter the world of soul and spirit without encountering the guardian of the threshold, we would succumb to one deception after another, because we would never be able to distinguish between what we ourselves were bringing into this world and what really belongs to it. Genuine training, however, is only permitted to lead students of the spirit into the domain of truth and not into the domain of illusion. It is inherent in this training that the encounter with the guardian must take place at some point, since it is an indispensable precautionary measure against the deception and illusory fantasy that are possible when we are observing supersensible worlds. One of the most indispensable precautions all students of the Spirit must take as individuals is to work carefully on themselves to avoid becoming delusional visionaries who may succumb to de deception and auto-suggestion. Whenever instructions for spiritual training are followed correctly, the potential sources of deception are destroyed. Of course, this is not the place to go into all the numerous details that have to be considered with regard to these precautions. Only the most important points can be indicated here. The deceptions that come into consideration here come from two sources. Some of them come from the fact that we color reality with our own soul nature. In ordinary life in the physical world of the senses, this source of deception poses relatively little danger, because there the outer world always forces itself upon our observations in its actual form, regardless of how we might attempt to color it with our desires and interests. But as soon as we enter the imaginative world, the images we perceive change because of these desires and interests of ours and we confront a seeming reality that we have shaped ourselves or have at least contributed to shaping. Through encountering the guardian of the threshold, students of the spirit become familiar with everything that is within them that they might carry into the world of soul and spirit. This eliminates the first source of deception. The preparation that students undergo before entering the world of soul and spirit accustoms them to disregarding themselves even when observing the physical world of the senses, allowing only the essence of things and events to speak to them. If we have prepared thoroughly enough, we can wait calmly to encounter the guardian of the threshold. This encounter will be the ultimate test of whether we are really also in a position to exclude our own being when we face the world of soul and spirit. In addition to this, still another source of deceptions appears when we misinterpret an impression we receive. A simple example of this type of deception in our physical sensory life is what happens when we sit in a train and think that the trees are moving in the opposite direction, while we ourselves are actually moving with the train. Although in many cases such deceptions in the physical world of the senses are more difficult to correct than this simple one, it is easy to see that in this world we find the means to do away with such deceptions if our sound judgment takes everything into account that can contribute to an appropriate explanation. The situation is different, of course, as soon as we make our way into supersensible domains. In the world of the senses, facts do not change when human beings are deceived, so it is possible for unbiased observation to use the facts 
to correct the deception. In the supersensible world, however, the matter is not that simple. If we apply false judgments in approaching a supersensible process we are trying to observe, we insert these false judgments into the process itself, where they become so entangled with actual fact that it is not immediately possible to distinguish them from the fact. In this case the error is not inside us and the correct fact outside. Our error has become a component of the external fact and can therefore not be corrected simply by observing the fact in an unbiased way. <clears throat> With this we have pointed to a superabundant source of possible deceptions and illusory fantasies for those who approach the supersensible world without the right preparation. Just as students of the Spirit acquire the ability to exclude deceptions that come about because of how their own nature colors supersensible phenomena, they must also acquire the gift of inactivating this second source of deception. They become able to exclude what comes from themselves once they have recognized the image of their own double, and they will be able to exclude this second source of deception once they have acquired the ability to recognize from the makeup of a supersensible fact, whether it is the truth or a deception. If deceptions looked exactly the same as facts, it would be impossible to distinguish between them, but this is not the case. In the supersensible worlds, deceptions have inherent qualities that distinguish them from realities. It is essential for students of the Spirit to know which qualities distinguish the realities. It seems self-evident that someone unacquainted with spiritual training might ask, how is there any possibility of protecting ourselves against deception, since there are so many sources of it? And are students of the Spirit ever certain that all their so-called higher knowledge is not based only on deception and auto-suggestion? Anyone who talks like this is not taking into account the fact that the very way a true spiritual training takes place blocks deceptions at the source. In the first place, through their preparation, true students of the Spirit will have acquired enough knowledge about the causes of deception and auto-suggestion auto to be able to protect themselves. In this respect, they have more opportunities than any others to become sufficiently matter-of-fact and competent to judge what they encounter in life. Everything they experience makes them distrust indefinite premonitions and questionable flashes of so-called inspiration. The training makes them as careful as possible. In addition, any true training first guides its students to thoughts about great cosmic events, that is, to things that force them to exert their powers of judgment, refining and sharpening them in the process. The only way we could miss out on this sharpening of our healthy powers of judgment, which give us certainty in distinguishing between deception and reality, would be by refusing to enter such distant realms and insisting on restricting ourselves to quote-unquote revelations closer at hand. However, all of this is not the most important thing. What is most important is inherent in the very exercises that are used in genuine spiritual training. They have to be arranged in such a way that the student's consciousness has a complete and exact overview of what is going on in the soul during meditation. First of all, a symbol is developed to bring about imagination. There are still images taken from outer perceptions in this symbol. We are not solely responsible for its content. And since we do not create it ourselves, it is possible for us to delude ourselves about how it comes about. We may misinterpret its origin. However, students of the Spirit remove this content from their consciousness when they move up to the exercises for inspiration where they contemplate only their own soul's activity that shaped the symbol. Here, too, error is possible. We have acquired the character of our soul activity through our upbringing, education, and so on. We cannot know everything about the origin of this activity. However, students of the Spirit also remove this activity of theirs from their consciousness. So if something still remains, there is no remnant of anything that cannot be surveyed. Anything that can possibly mingle with this can be assessed with regard to its entire content. In their intuition, 
Students of the Spirit thus possess something that shows them the makeup of anything that is a totally clear reality in the world of soul and spirit. If they then apply the signs they have recognized as being characteristic of soul spiritual reality to everything that presents itself to their observation, they will be able to distinguish semblances from realities. And they can be certain that applying this law will protect them from deception in the supersensible world, just as certainly as they will not mistake an imagined piece of hot iron for a real one that actually burns them in the physical world of the senses. It goes without saying that we will only apply these criteria to knowledge we regard as our own experience in the supersensible worlds and not to what we receive as communications from others and understand with our physical intellect and our healthy feeling for the truth. Spiritual science will attempt to draw a precise boundary between what they have acquired in these two different ways. They will willingly receive information about the higher worlds and attempt to understand it with their powers of judgment, but when they categorize something as personal experience or direct observation, they will have tested whether it presents the very same characteristics that infallible intuition has taught them to perceive. Once students of the Spirit have the encounter with the guardian of the threshold behind them, they face further experiences as they ascend into supersensible worlds. First of all, they notice a certain inner relationship between this guardian and the seventh soul force that was described above as forming itself into an independent entity. In a certain respect, this seventh being is none other than the double, the actual guardian of the threshold. It poses a specific task to students of the spirit. They must use their newborn selves to guide what they are in their ordinary selves, which appear to them in images. This results in a sort of struggle against the double, who will constantly try to gain the upper hand. Achieving the right relationship with the double, not allowing it to do anything that does not happen under the influences of the newborn eye, strengthens and consolidates the forces of the human being. In the higher world, self-knowledge is different in some respects than it is in the physical world of the senses, where self-knowledge appears only as an inner experience. In contrast, the newborn self immediately presents itself as an external soul phenomenon. We each see our own newborn self as a separate being in front of us, but we are not able to perceive it fully. Regardless of what level we have reached on the path to supersensible worlds, there are always still higher levels where we will perceive ever more of the higher self, which can therefore reveal itself only partially at any given level. However, when we first become aware of some aspect of the higher self, we are overcome by an extremely great temptation to look at it from the standpoint we acquired in the physical world of the senses, so to speak. This temptation is actually a good thing, and it must happen if our inner development is to proceed properly. We must each observe our double, the guardian of the threshold, and place it in front of the higher self in order to notice the discrepancy between what we are and what we are meant to become. When we do this, however, the guardian of the threshold begins to assume a completely different form. It pre presents itself as an image of all the obstacles confronting the development of the higher self. We perceive what a burden we <clears throat> are each dragging around with us in the form of the ordinary self. If our preparations have not made us strong enough to say, quote, I am not going to stop here, I will strive unceasingly to develop toward my higher self, unquote, we will falter and shrink back from what is ahead of us. In this case we have plunged into the world of soul and spirit, but quit working our way forward. We become prisoners of the form that now stands before our souls as the guardian of the threshold. The significant thing about this experience is that we don't have the feeling of being prisoners. We are much more likely to believe that we are experiencing something completely different. The figure summoned up by the guardian of the threshold can create the impression in our souls that the images appearing to us at this stage of our development already encompass all possible worlds, that we have arrived at the pinnacle of knowledge and no longer need to exert ourselves. Instead of feeling like prisoners, it's possible for us to feel that we possess all the immeasurably rich secrets of the cosmos. 
we will not be surprised by this experience, which is the exact opposite of the true state of affairs, if we consider that we are already in the world of soul and spirit when we have this experience, and that one of the world's idiosyncrasies is that experiences can appear in reverse. This fact was already pointed out earlier in this book when life after death was described. <clears throat> the figure that we perceive at this stage of our development shows us something different from what first appeared to us as the guardian of the threshold. In the double, as we first perceived it, we saw all the character traits that the ordinary self possesses as a result of the influence of luciferic forces. However, in the course of human evolution, another power has also been able to move into the human soul because of Lucifer's influence. This is what was described as the power of Araman in earlier chapters of this book. It is the power that prevents us from perceiving the soul spiritual beings of the outer world lying behind the surface of sense perceptible things. What the human soul has become under the influence of this power is shown in image form in the figure that appears during the experience that has just been described. If we approach this experience with the right preparation, we will interpret it correctly and then another figure will soon appear. In contrast to the lesser guardian described earlier, we can call this figure the greater guardian of the threshold. The greater guardian tells us that we must not remain at this stage, but must continue to work energetically. The greater guardian awakens in us the awareness that the world we have conquered will only become a truth and not metamorphose into illusion if we continue to work in the appropriate way. However, if we approach this experience without having been prepared for it by a proper spiritual training, when we encounter the great guardian something that can only be compared to a feeling of immeasurable horror or boundless fear will fill our souls. Just as the encounter with the lesser guardian makes it possible for us to test whether we are protected against the deceptions that can arise when we insert our own being into the supersensible world, the experiences that ultimately lead us to the greater guardian allow us to test whether we are capable of overcoming the deceptions that can be traced back to the second source described above. If we are able to resist the immense illusion that leads us to believe that the world of images we have reached is a rich possession, while in reality we are mere prisoners, we will also be protected against mistaking semblance for reality in the further course of our development. To a certain extent, the guardian of the threshold will assume an individually different form for each human being. The encounter with the guardian corresponds to the experience that overcomes the personal character of our supersensible observations and makes it possible for us to enter an area of experience that is free of personal color coloring and valid for every human being. Students of the spirit who have had the experiences described above are then able to distinguish what they themselves are from what is outside of them in their soul spiritual surroundings. They will then realize that we need to understand the cosmic process described in this book in order to understand human beings themselves and their lives. We understand the physical body only if we recognize how it has been built up through Saturn, Sun, Moon and Earth phases of evolution. We understand the ether body only if we trace its development through the Sun, Moon and Earth phases and so on. However, we also understand what is presently involved in the Earth's evolution if we recognize how all this has unfolded gradually. Spiritual training puts us in a position to recognize that everything in the human being is related to corresponding facts and beings in the world outside of us. It is a fact that every part and organ of the human being is related to all the rest of the world. In this book it has only been possible to present a sketchy outline of the facts. However, we must keep in mind that the physical human body, for example, was present only in seminal form during the Saturn phase of evolution. Later, during the Sun, Moon and Earth phases, its organs, hearts, lungs, brain evolved from this seminal endowment. Thus our heart, lungs and so on are related to the Sun, Moon and Earth phases of evolution. Something similar is true of the organs of the ether body, sentient body, sentient soul and so on. 
human beings took shape out of the entire world, immediately surrounding them, and every detail of our human makeup corresponds to a process or being in the outer world. At the appropriate level of inner development, students of the Spirit begin to recognize this relationship between their own individual beings and the greater world. This level of cognition can be described as becoming aware of the correspondence between the microcosm or smaller world, that is the human being, and the macrocosm or greater world. Having broken through to this stage of knowledge, students of the Spirit can then begin to have a new experience. In spite of being aware of themselves and their full independence, they begin to feel as if they have grown together with the entire structure of the cosmos. They have a feeling of merging with the entire cosmos and becoming one with it, yet without losing their essential nature. We can describe this level of development as, quote, becoming one with the macrocosm, unquote. It is important not to think of this as a cessation of an individual, of an individual consciousness, as if the essence of a human individual were flowing out into the universe. To think of it in this way would only reflect the opinion of an untrained faculty of judgment. In the sense of the initiation process described here, the individual stages of higher cognition can be listed as follows. Number one, studying spiritual science by initially making use of the power of judgment which we have acquired in the physical world of the senses. Two, acquiring imaginative cognition. Three, reading the hidden script. This corresponds to inspiration. Four, living one's life into the spiritual surroundings. This corresponds to intuition. 5. Recognizing the relationship between the microcosm and the macrocosm. 6. Becoming one with the macrocosm. 7. Experiencing all of these previous experiences as a totality, as a fundamental mood of soul. We do not necessarily need to think of these stages as happening one after the other. On the contrary, depending on the individual student, training may proceed so that one level has been only partially completed before the student begins with exercises that correspond to the next level. For example, it may be very good for a certain student to do exercises leading to personal experiences in inspiration, intuition, or recognizing the connection between microcosm and macrocosm even though he or she has only acquired a few imaginations with any degree of certainty. Once students of the Spirit have experienced intuition, in addition to being able to recognize the images of the world of soul and spirit and read their interrelationships in the hidden script, they will also acquire direct knowledge of the actual beings who work together to bring about the world to which we human beings belong. Through this, they also get to know themselves in the forms they possess as spiritual beings in the world of soul and spirit. They have worked hard to be able to perceive the higher I and have realized how they need to continue working in order to control the double, the guardian of the threshold. But they have also encountered the greater guardian who constantly urges them on to greater effort. This greater guardian becomes the example they want to emulate and once this has happened, it becomes possible for them to recognize who it is standing in front of them in the form of the greater guardian. In the student's perception, the greater guardian is now transformed into the figure of the Christ. The essence of this being and his intervention in earth's evolution has been made, made clear in earlier chapters of this book. In this way, students of the Spirit are initiated into that same exalted mystery that is linked with the name of Christ. The Christ discloses himself to them as the great example for human beings on earth. To those who have recognized the Christ in a spiritual world as a result of their initiation, historical events on earth in the fourth post-Atlantean evolutionary period, the Greco-Latin age, also become comprehensible. For students of the Spirit, the intervention of the exalted Son being, the Christ being, in Earth's evolution at that time and His ongoing work within this evolution become a matter of direct experience and personal knowledge. Through intuition, therefore, the purpose and significance of Earth's evolution are revealed to students of the Spirit. 
The path that is described here as leading to knowledge of the supersensible worlds is one that every human being can follow, regardless of his or her present situation in life. In talking about such a path, we must keep in mind that although the goal of knowledge and truth is the same in all ages of Earth's evolution, the starting points have been different at different times. People wanting to set out on the path to the spiritual world at present cannot start from the same point as ancient Egyptian candidates for initiation, for example. That's why present-day individuals cannot simply take up the exercises assigned to students of the spirit in ancient Egypt. Since that time, human souls have progressed through various incarnations, and this process is not without meaning and significance. The abilities and characteristics of human souls change from incarnation to incarnation. Even if we observe human history only superficially, we can see that all of life's circumstances were different after the 12th or 13th century than they were before. Opinions, feelings, and even human abilities changed. The path to higher cognition that is described here is one that is suitable for souls incarnating in the immediate present. It takes its point of departure for spiritual development from where people stand at present, whatever the circumstances of their individual lives may be. Just as the forms of outer life change, evolution from one period to the next leads humankind to ever different forms with regard to the paths to higher cognition. At any given time, outer life and initiation must be in perfect harmony. The end of chapter 5 of an outline of esoteric science. This is chapter 6 of an outline of esoteric science by Rudolf Steiner. The chapter is entitled Cosmic and Human Evolution Now and in the Future. Unless we understand past evolution, it is impossible to know anything about the present and future states of human and cosmic evolution in the sense of spiritual science because everything spiritual researchers are able to know about the present and the future is simultaneously present in what presents itself to their perception as they observe the hidden facts of the past. This book has dealt with the Saturn, Sun, Moon and Earth phases of evolution. Without observing the facts of previous evolutionary phases, we cannot understand the Earth phase of evolution in the sense of spiritual science because in a certain respect the realities of the Moon, Sun and Saturn phases are present in what confronts us now in the earthly world. The beings and things that were involved in the Moon phase continued to evolve and everything that belongs to our present Earth came from them. However, not everything that came from the Moon and has now become the Earth is perceptible to consciousness in the physical world of the senses. Part of what passed from the moon to the earth in the course of evolution only becomes evident at a certain level of supersensible consciousness. Having reached this level of cognition, we can perceive that our earthly world is connected to a supersensible world which contains the part of moon existence that did not condense enough to be physically perceived by our senses. The supersensible world contains this aspect of the moon as it is at present, not as it was during the ancient moon phase of evolution. However, it is possible for supersensible consciousness to get a picture of conditions at that time. When this supersensible consciousness concentrates on the perception that is possible at present, it becomes evident that this perception is gradually separating into two images all by itself. One, ib one image represents the form the Earth had during its moon phase of evolution. But as the other image presents itself, we can recognize that it contains a form that is still in a seminal stage. Only in the future will it become a reality in the way that the Earth is a reality now. On further observation, it becomes apparent that in a certain sense, the results of what happens on Earth are constantly flowing into this future form, which therefore represents what our Earth is meant to become. The effects of earthly existence will unite with what happens in this other world, giving rise to the new cosmic being into which the Earth will eventually be transformed, just as the Moon was transformed into the Earth. We can call this future form 
the Jupiter stage. If this Jupiter stage is observed by means of supersensible perception, it becomes evident that in the future certain processes will have to take place because certain beings and things are present in the supersensible part of the earthly world that came from the moon. These beings and things will assume certain forms after various events have taken place within the physical sense-perceptible earth realm. This means that the Jupiter stage will contain something that has already been predetermined by the moon phase of evolution, and it will also contain something new that is entering evolution as a whole only because of processes taking place on the earth. This is why it is possible for supersensible consciousness to experience something of what will happen during the Jupiter stage. The beings and facts that can be perceived within this field of consciousness do not have the character of sensory images. They do not even appear as delicate, airy structures that might give rise to effects reminiscent of sense impressions. The impressions we receive from them are purely spiritual impressions of sound, light, and warmth that are not expressed through material embodiments of any sort. They can only be grasped by means of supersensible consciousness. It is possible to say that such beings have quote-unquote bodies, but these bodies become apparent within the soul element, their present essential nature like a sum of condensed memories that these beings carry in their soul nature. Within such beings we can distinguish be between what they are now experiencing and what they have already experienced and now remember. The latter is contained in them like a bodily element, which is experienced in the same way that earthly human beings experience their bodies. At a higher stage of supersensible cognition than that just described as necessary for perceiving the moon and Jupiter, it is possible to perceive supersensible things and beings that are further evolved forms of what was already present during the sun stage. At present these figures have achieved such high levels of existence that they are not perceptible at all to consciousness that has only reached the level of being able to perceive moon forms. This world's image also splits into two when we contemplate it inwardly. One image leads to knowledge of the past sun stage, while the other presents a future form of the earth. The earth will assume this form when the effects of the earth and Jupiter processes have flowed into the forms of this world. Spiritual science calls this the Venus stage. Similarly, a future stage of evolution that can be called the Vulcan stage, which has the same relationship to the Saturn stage as Venus to the Sun and Jupiter to the Moon, becomes evident to a still more highly developed supersensible consciousness. Therefore, in considering the past, present, and future of the Earth, we can speak of the Saturn, Sun, Moon, Earth, Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan phases of evolution. Several chapters in this book have described how the human world and human beings themselves move through the stages that have been given the names Saturn, Sun, Moon, Earth, Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan. The relationship of human evolution to certain celestial bodies, which coexist with the Earth and have been given the names Saturn, Jupiter, and Mars, and so on, was also indicated. Of course, these heavenly bodies are also undergoing evolutions of their own. At the present time, they have reached the stage where their physical aspects present themselves to our perception as the entities that physical astronomy knows as Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, and so on. In the sense of spiritual science, present-day Saturn is a reincarnation of ancient Saturn, so to speak, and came about because of the presence of certain beings prior to the Sun's separation from the Earth. These particular beings were unable to participate in this separation because they had incorporated so many characteristics suited to Saturn existence that they were out of place on a cosmic body that concentrated primarily on developing Sun characteristics. Present-day Jupiter, however, came about because of the presence of beings with characteristics that will only be able to develop during the future Jupiter stage of general evolution. A dwelling place was made where they could foreshadow this future evolution. Mars is a celestial body inhabited by beings who went through the moon phase of evolution in such a way that they no longer had anything to gain from staying on Earth, 
Mars is a reincarnation of old moon on a higher level. Present-day Mercury is the dwelling of beings who are ahead of the Earth's evolution because they have developed certain earthly characteristics in a higher form than is possible on Earth. In a similar way, present-day Venus prophetically anticipates the Venus stage of the future. Because of all this, we are quite justified in giving the stages before and after the Earth phase the names of their present representatives in the cosmos. It goes without saying that when people want to use intellects trained in the outer observation of nature to judge the parallel drawn here between the supersensibly perceived states of Saturn, Sun, and so on, and their namesakes among the physical heavenly bodies, they will raise many objections to what has been presented here. But just as it is possible to use mathematical concepts to visualize the solar system as an image of happenings in time and space, it is also possible for supersensible cognition to imbue this mathematical image with a soul content so that it takes on a form that permits drawing this parallel. Imbuing the image with soul content in this way, however, is also fully consistent with the further application of a strict natural scientific method of observation. At the moment, this natural scientific method still restricts itself to trying to express the interrelationship between the solar system and the earth in purely mathematical, mechanical concepts, while the natural science of the future will of itself be driven to expand these mechanical concepts to include ones imbued with soul. It would certainly be possible to show that these modern natural scientific ideas already provide sufficient grounds for expanding these concepts, but this undertaking would require a whole book in itself. All that can be done here is to point to this matter, although doing so exposes it to many misunderstandings as well as a result. The disagreements between spiritual science and natural science are often only apparent ones. They result simply from the refusal of natural science to formulate ideas that are demanded not only by supersensible cognition, but also, if the truth be told, by cognition that restricts itself to sense-perceptible things. Everywhere in the results of modern natural scientific observations, unbiased observers can find indications of other fields of purely sensory, physical observation that will have to be investigated in a purely natural scientific manner in the future. Such investigations will show that a full observation of nature confirms what supersensible perception reveals about any supersensible cosmic events with corresponding sense-perceptible manifestations. In addition to the comprehensive circumstances of Earth's evolution, observations of the nearer future also present themselves to our consciousness. Every image of the past corresponds to one of the future. However, in discussing these things, we must emphasize something that urgently needs to be taken into account. If we want to know about things like this, we must totally relinquish the view that philosophical contemplation, educated merely by sense-perceptible reality, is capable of discovering anything about them. These things cannot and should not ever be researched by thinking about them in this way. If we were to believe that because spiritual science has already supplied us with information about the moon phase of evolution, we will now be able to discover what things will look like on Jupiter by comparing the circumstances of Earth and Moon and applying this kind of thinking, we will succumb to enormous deceptions. These circumstances should only be researched through supersensible consciousness that rises to the level necessary to observe them. Only when the results of this research have been communicated is it also possible to understand them without supersensible consciousness. Spiritual researchers are in a different position with regard to communications about the future than they are with regard to those about the past. We are not initially able to confront future events as impartially as we confront the past. What will happen in the future stirs up our feeling and willing, but we tolerate the past quite differently. Anyone who observes life will know that this is true even of our ordinary existence, but only those who are aware of certain things in the supersensible worlds can know what forms this ten tendency assumes and to what an enormous extent it increases with regard to life's hidden facts. This is the reason why knowledge of these things is kept within very specific limits. 
just as the greater cosmic evolution can be presented as a succession of states from Saturn through the Vulcan phase. It is also possible to present shorter spans of time, such as those that make up the Earth phase of evolution. The enormous upheaval that brought an end to life on Atlantis was followed by the stages in human evolution that have been described in this book as the ancient Indian, ancient Persian, Egypto-Chaldean, and Greco-Latin cultural periods. The fifth period is where we stand now, the present. This period began gradually around the 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries AD, after having been prepared ever since the 4th and 5th centuries. It has been clearly evident ever since the 15th century. The Greco-Latin period that preceded it began around the 8th century BC, and at the end of its first third, the Christ event took place. The disposition and faculties of the human soul changed during the transition from the Egypto-Chaldean period to the Greco-Latin. During the Egypto-Chaldean period, what we now know as logical thinking, or grasping the world through reason, did not yet exist. At that time the knowledge we now make, our own, through our intellect, was acquired in a way that was appropriate then, directly through an inner knowledge that was supersensible in a certain respect. While people perceived things, the necessary concept or image of those things simply appeared in their souls. When the faculty of cognition is like this, not only do images of the physical world of the senses appear, but a certain knowledge of non-sensory realities and beings also rises out of the soul's depths. This was a remnant of the ancient dusk-like supersensible consciousness that all of humankind had formerly possessed. In the Greco-Latin age, there were more and more people who lacked this faculty. In its place, the capacity for intellectual reflection appeared. People became more and more removed from direct dreamlike perception of the world of soul and spirit, and ever more dependent on their intellect and feelings to provide an image of that world. In some respects, this state of affairs continued throughout the fourth post-Atlantean period. Only those individuals who had retained the legacy of the former soul disposition, so to speak, were able to admit the spiritual world into their consciousness directly. These people, however, were holdovers from an earlier age. Their type of cognition was no longer suited to the new age, because as a result of the laws of evolution, an old soul capacity loses its full significance when new faculties appear. Human life adapts to these new faculties and no longer knows what to do with the old ones. There were also individuals, however, who quite consciously began to develop other, higher powers in addition to the powers of intellect and feeling they had acquired. These powers made it possible for them to break through into the world of soul and spirit again. The way they had to begin to do this was quite different from how it had happened among the students of the ancient initiates, who had not had to consider the soul faculties that developed only during the fourth post-Atlantean period. This fourth period saw the first beginnings of the type of modern spiritual training that has been described in this book. However, at that time it was only in its beginning stages. It could only be fully developed in the fifth post-Atlantean period, beginning with the twelfth and thirteenth centuries, and especially since the fifteenth century. People who attempted to ascend into supersensible worlds in this way were able to experience something about higher realms of existence through their own imagination, inspiration, and intuition. To those who were content with the faculties of intellect and feeling that had developed, what ancient clairvoyance had known was accessible only through oral or written traditions that were passed down from generation to generation. For people born after the Christ event, who did not make their way up into supersensible worlds, such traditions were also their only means of knowing anything about the essential nature of this event. However, there were certain initiates who still possessed the old natural ability to perceive the supersensible world, and whose development allowed them to enter a higher world, in spite of the fact that they disregarded humankind's new intellectual and emotional powers. They created a transition from the old form of initiation to the new one. People like this were also present in subsequent periods. However, the essential characteristic of the fourth post-Atlantean period was that human powers of intellect and feeling were strengthened 
by being cut off from direct interaction with the world of soul and spirit. The souls who incarnated then and greatly developed these powers then carried the results of their development over into their incarnation during the fifth period. As compensation for having been cut off from the spiritual world, the mighty traditions of ancient wisdom were available, especially those having to do with the Christ event. Through the very power of their content, these traditions provided human souls with a confident knowledge of the higher world. There were also always human souls, however, who developed their powers of higher cognition in addition to their faculties of intellect and feeling. It was incumbent upon them to experience the realities of the higher world and especially the mystery of the Christ event by means of direct, supersensible knowledge. They always allowed as much of this to flow into other human souls as was comprehensible to them and good for them. <coughs> in harmony with the purpose of Earth's evolution, the first expansion of Christianity was meant to take place at a time when most of humankind had not developed faculties of supersensible cognition. This is why the force of tradition was so powerful at that time. An extremely powerful force was needed to make people confident in the supersensible world if they themselves were not able to behold this world. With the exception of a brief time during the 13th century, there were almost always individuals who were capable of lifting themselves up into the higher worlds through imagination, inspiration, and intuition. In the Christian era, these people were the successors of the initiates of antiquity, who had been leaders and members of the century, centers of mystery wisdom. The task of these new initiates was to recognize once again, through their own faculties, what had once been comprehended through ancient mystery wisdom, and to add to this a knowledge of the essential nature of the Christ event. Thus the knowledge arising among the new initiates encompassed all the subject matter of ancient initiation, but from its center radiated the higher knowledge of the mysteries of the Christ event. As long as the human souls of the fourth post-Atlantean period were meant to be consolidating their faculties of intellect and feeling, this knowledge was only able to flow into general life to a limited extent. So, during that time, it was really quite hidden. Then the New Age of the Fifth Cultural Period dawned. Its main feature was the further development of intellectual abilities, which blossomed exuberantly then and will continue to unfold in the present and future. A gradual build-up to this period began in the 12th and 13th centuries and its progress accelerated from the 16th century onward into the present. Under these influences, Cultivating the forces of reason became the chief concern of evolution in the fifth cultural period. In contrast, traditional knowledge of and confidence in a supersensible world lost more and more of its power over human souls. However, it was replaced by what we may call an increasingly strong influx into hu human souls of knowledge derived from modern supersensible consciousness. Quote unquote, hidden knowledge was now flowing, although imperceptibly to begin with, into people's ways of thinking. It is self-evident that intellectual forces have continued to reject this knowledge right into the present. But what must happen will happen in spite of any temporary rejection. Symbolically, this hidden knowledge, which is taking hold of humanity from the other side and will do so increasingly in the future, can be called, quote, the knowledge of the grail, unquote. If we learn to understand the deeper meaning of this symbol, as it is presented in stories and legends, we will discover a significant image of what has been described above as the new initiation knowledge with the Christ mystery at its center. Therefore, modern initiates can also be known as Grail initiates. The path to supersensible worlds, whose first stages have been described in this book, leads to, quote, the science of the Grail, unquote. A, un a unique feature of this knowledge is that its facts can only be investigated by those who acquire the means of doing so that are described in this book. Once these facts have been discovered, however, they can then be understood by means of the soul forces that have been developing during the fifth cultural period. In fact, it will become increasingly evident that these forces will find their satisfaction in this knowledge to an ever greater extent. At present we are living in a time when more of this knowledge ought to enter human common consciousness than was formerly the case. 
This book hopes to convey the information it contains from this point of view. To the extent that human evolution will absorb grail knowledge, the impulse supplied by the Christ event can become ever more significant. Increasingly an inner aspect will be added to the external aspect of Christian evolution. What we can recognize through imagination, inspiration and intuition about the higher worlds in conjunction with the Christ mystery will increasingly permeate our life of ideas, feeling and will. Hidden, in quotes, grail knowledge will become evident as an inner force it will increasingly permeate the manifestations of human life. For the duration of the fifth cultural period, knowledge of supersensible worlds will continue to flow into human consciousness. When the sixth period begins, humanity will have been able to reacquire the non-sensory perception it possessed in a dusk-like way in earlier times. But now on a higher level, and in a form that is quite different from the old perception, in ancient times, when our souls knew about the higher worlds, excuse me, let me read that again. In ancient times, what our souls knew about the higher worlds was not imbued with our own forces of reason and feeling. It was received as inspiration from above. In the future, our souls will not only receive these flashes of inspiration, but will also comprehend them and experience them as the essence of human soul nature. In future, when a soul receives knowledge about a certain being or thing, the very nature of the intellect will find this justified. If knowledge of a different sort asserts itself, knowledge of a moral commandment or a human behavior, the soul will tell itself, my feelings will only be justified if I act in accordance with this knowledge. A sufficiently large number of human beings are meant to develop this state of mind during the sixth post-Atlantean cultural period. In a certain way, what the Third or Egypto-Chaldean period contributed to humanity's evolution is being repeated in the Fifth. At that time, the human soul still perceived certain realities of the supersensible world, although this perception was waning as intellectual faculties prepared to emerge. These faculties were to temporarily exclude human beings from the higher world. In the Fifth Cultural Period, the supersensible realities that had been perceived in a dusk-like state of consciousness are becoming evident again, but are now being imbued with our own personal forces of intellect and feeling and with what human souls can gain through knowledge of the Christ mystery. This is why they are assuming different forms than they did previously. In ancient times, impressions from the supersensible worlds were experienced as forces that urged human beings on but emanated from an outer spiritual world that did not include them. In contrast, more recent evolution shows us to perceive these impressions as coming from a world we human beings are growing into and are increasingly a part of. No one ought to believe that the Egypto-Chaldean cultural period will be repeated in such a way that our souls will simply be able to take up what was then present and has come down to us from those times. If understood correctly, the effect of the Christ impulse is to make the human souls that receive it feel, recognize, and conduct themselves as members of a spiritual world, whereas formerly they were outsiders. While the third cultural period is revived in the fifth in order to be imbued with the totally new elements in human souls provided by the fourth period, something similar happens in the sixth cultural period with regard to the second and in the seventh with regard to the first or ancient Indian cultural period. All the wonderful wisdom that the great teachers of ancient India could proclaim will be able to reappear as life truths in human souls in the seventh cultural period. Now any transformations in things in the earthly world outside of human beings also have a certain relationship to humankind's own evolution. When the seventh cultural period has run its course, the earth will be struck by an upheaval comparable to the one that took place between the Atlantean and post-Atlantean ages. After this, evolution will continue under transformed earthly circumstances through seven more time periods. On a higher level, the human souls incarnating then will experience the same fellowship with a higher world that the Atlanteans experienced on a lower level. 
however only human beings embodying souls that have become all that they could under the influence of the Greco-Latin cultural period and the subsequent 5th, 6th and 7th periods of post-Atlantean evolution will be able to cope with these reconfigured earthly circumstances. The inner nature of these souls will correspond to what the earth has then become. Other souls will have to remain behind at this stage, although earlier they could still have chosen to create the prerequisites for participation in it. The souls mature enough to face the conditions that will exist after the next great upheaval will be the ones who succeeded in imbuing supersensible knowledge with their own forces of intellect and feeling at the transition from the 5th to the 6th post-Atlantean period. The 5th and 6th periods are the decisive ones, so to speak. In the 7th period, although the souls who have achieved the goal of the 6th will continue to develop accordingly, the changed circumstances in their surroundings will provide little opportunity for the others to make up for lost time. The next opportunity will present itself only in the distant future. This is how evolution is proceeding from one age to the next. Supersensible cognition observes not only future changes involving the earth alone, but also ones that occur in interaction with the neighboring heavenly bodies. There will come a time when both the earth and humanity have made such progress in evolution that the forces and beings that had to separate from the earth during Lemurian times to enable earthly beings to continue to progress will be able to reunite with the earth. At that time the moon will reconnect with the earth. This will happen because sufficient numbers of human souls possess enough inner strength to make these moon forces fruitful for further evolution. This will take place at a time when another development that has turned toward evil will be taking place alongside the high level of development reached by the appropriate number of human souls. Souls whose development has been delayed will have accumulated so much error, ugliness and evil in their karma that they temporarily form a distinct union of evil and aberrant human beings who vehemently oppose the community of good human beings. In the course of its development the good portion of humankind will learn to use the moon forces to transform the evil part so that it can participate in further evolution as a distinct earthly kingdom. Through the work of the good part of humanity, the earth, then reunited with the moon, will become able to reunite with the sun after a certain period of evolution, and also with the other planets. After an interim stage that resembles a sojourn in a higher world, the earth will transform itself into the Jupiter state. During the Jupiter stage, what is now called the mineral kingdom will not exist. Mineral forces will have been transformed into plant forces. The lowest kingdom appearing during the Jupiter stage will be the plant kingdom, which will have a form entirely different from what it has now. Above that will be the animal kingdom, which will have undergone a comparable transformation, followed by a human kingdom, consisting of the descendants of the evil union that came about on earth. Above these there will be a higher human kingdom, consisting of the descendants of the community of good human beings on earth. A great deal of the work of this second human kingdom will consist of ennobling the fallen souls in the evil union, so that they will still be able to find their way back into the actual human kingdom. At the Venus stage, the plant kingdom will also have disappeared, and the lowest kingdom will be the animal kingdom, transformed once more. Above that there will be three human kingdoms of different degrees of perfection. During the Venus stage the earth will remain united with the sun. <clears throat> In contrast, as evolution proceeds on Jupiter, the sun will once again break away from Jupiter and influence it from outside. Then a reunification of the sun and Jupiter will take place and the transformation into the Venus stage will gradually continue. During the Venus stage, a distinct cosmic body will break away, containing all the, thing, all the beings who have resisted evolution and constituting an quote-unquote unredeemable moon, so to speak. In quotes. It will move toward an evolution that is so different in character from anything we can experience on Earth that there are no words that can possibly express it.
The part of humanity that has continued to evolve, however, will move on to the Vulcan phase of evolution in a fully spiritualized form of existence. Describing, describing this state falls outside the scope of this book. We see that the highest imaginable ideal of human evolution results from grail knowledge, that is, the spiritualization that we achieve through our own work. Ultimately, this spiritualization will appear as the result of the harmony that human beings were able to bring about in the fifth and sixth cultural periods between their forces of intellect and feeling and their knowledge of supersensible worlds. What they produced there in their inmost souls will ultimately become the outer world. The human spirit raises itself up to the mighty impressions of its outer world, first divining and later recognizing the spiritual beings behind these impressions, while the human heart senses the infinite loftiness of these, this spiritual element. However, human beings can also recognize their own inner experiences of intellect, feeling and morality as the seeds of a future spiritual world. If we believe that human freedom is incompatible with foreknowledge and with predestination of the shape of things to come, we should think of it like this. Our free action in the future will depend as little on what predestined things will be like then as it does on our intention to be living a year from now in a house we design today. To the extent that our inner nature permits, we will be free in the house we have built for ourselves and we will also be free in the circumstances that come about on Venus and Jupiter to the extent that our own inner nature permits. Our freedom will not depend on what is predestined by prior circumstances, but, what, but on what our souls have made of themselves. The Earth stage contains what evolved during the preceding Saturn, Sun and Moon phases of evolution. Earthly human beings find wisdom in the events taking place around them. It is there as the result of what happened previously. The earth is the descendant of the old moon, which shaped itself and everything belonging to it into the cosmos of wisdom. The earth, which is the beginning of an evolution that will inject new force into this wisdom, brings human beings to the point where they experience themselves as independent members of a spiritual world. This is due to the fact that the human eye was fashioned by the spirits of form during the earth phase of evolution. Just as the physical body was shaped by the spirits of will on Saturn, the life body by the spirits of wisdom on the sun, and the astral body by the spirits of motion on the moon. What manifests as wisdom does so through the interaction of the spirits of will, wisdom, and motion. In wisdom, earthly beings and processes can exist in harmony with the other beings of their world through the work of these three orders of spiritual beings. In the future, the independent human eye, which was received through the spirits of form, will exist in harmony with the beings of Earth, Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan, because of the power that the Earth stage injects into wisdom. This is the power of love, which must begin in human beings on Earth. The, quote, cosmos of wisdom, unquote, is developing into a cosmo, quote, unquote, cosmos of love. Everything that the eye can develop within itself must turn into love. The exalted sun being we were able to characterize in describing Christ's evolution manifests as the all-encompassing example of love, planting the seed of love in the innermost core of the human being. From there it is meant to flow out into all of evolution. Just as wisdom, which formed earlier, discloses itself in the forces of the sense-perceptible earthly world in present-day forces of nature, love itself will appear as a new natural force in all phenomena in the future. This is the mystery of all future evolution, that our knowledge and everything we do out of a true understanding of evolution sow seeds that must ripen into love. The greater the power of love that comes into being, the more we will be able to accomplish creativity on behalf of the future. The strongest forces working toward the end result of spiritualization lie in what will, be, in what will come from love. 
The more spiritual knowledge flows into the evolution of humanity and the earth, the greater the number of viable seeds will there be for the future. Through its very nature, spiritual knowledge transforms itself into love. The whole process that has been described, beginning with the Greco-Latin cultural period and extending throughout the present time, shows how this transformation is to proceed. It also shows us the purpose of this future evolution that is now in its beginning stages. The wisdom for which the groundwork was laid on Saturn, Sun and Moon works in the human physical, etheric and astral bodies, presenting itself as cosmic wisdom. In the eye, however, it becomes inner wisdom. Beginning with the earth phase of evolution, the wisdom of the outer cosmos becomes inner wisdom in the human being. Internalized in this way, it becomes the seed of love. Wisdom is the prerequisite for love. Love is the result of wisdom that has been reborn in the I. If anyone is misled into believing that evolution, as it has been explained above, bears a fatalistic stamp, this is a result of having misunderstood the explanations. If we were to believe that evolution condemns a certain number of people to become members of the kingdom of evil humanity, in quotes, we would have failed to see how the interrelationship between the sense perceptible and the soul spiritual takes shape in the course of this evolution. Within certain limits, these worlds, both the sense perceptible and the soul spiritual, each constitute a separate evolutionary current. Through forces inherent in the sense perceptible current, the forms of quote unquote evil human beings come about. However, it will only be necessary for any given human soul to incarnate in such a body if it has created the necessary preconditions itself. It might also happen that the forms arising out of the forces of the sense perceptible world find no reincarnating human souls to embody because these souls have all become too good for such bodies. In that case, the cosmos would have to ensoul these forms with something other than formerly human souls. Such forms will be occupied by human souls only when these same souls have prepared themselves for such an incarnation. In this field, supersensible cognition is bound to report what it sees. For instance, that at a particular point in the future there will be two human kingdoms, one good and one evil. However, this does not mean that the present state of human souls forces supersensible cognition to the rational conclusion that this future state will be the natural and inevitable result. Supersensible cognition's ways of investigating the evolution of human forms and the evolution of the destinies of souls are and must be completely separate and to confuse the two in our worldview would be a remnant of a materialistic attitude that would seriously impinge on the science of the supersensible. The end of chapter 6 of An Outline of Esoteric Science Okay, This is chapter 7 of An Outline of Esoteric Science by Rudolf Steiner entitled Details from the Field of Spiritual Science The Human Ether Body when we perceive the higher members of our human makeup through supersensible observation, this perception is never completely similar to a perception we have through our outer senses. When we touch an outer object and have a perception of warmth, we must distinguish between what comes from the object, what streams out of it, so to speak, and what we experience in our souls. Our inner soul experience of the perception of warmth is something different from the warmth that flows out of the object. Now let's imagine this soul experience all by itself without the outer object. Let's imagine the experience of a perception of warmth in the soul with no physical outer object to cause it. If this experience were simply present without cause, it would be imaginary. However, students of the spirit do experience inner perceptions such as this that have no physical cause. Above all, they are not caused by the student's physical bodies. But at a certain level of inner development, these perceptions present themselves in such a way that the students can tell that the inner perception is not imaginary, but has been brought about by a being of soul and spirit in a supersensible outer world. Just as an ordinary perception of warmth, for example, is brought about by an external physical sense-perceptible object, 
It was shown earlier how the experience itself lets us know that it is not imaginary. Thus, this is also true if we speak about perceptions of color. In that case, we have to distinguish between the color of the outer object and the inner sensation of color in the soul. Let's recall the inner sensation the soul has when it perceives a red object in the physical sense perceptible outer world. Let's imagine that we vividly recollect the impression while averting our eyes from the object. Let's remember the inner experience of our mental image of the color. When we do this, we distinguish between the outer color and our inner experience of it. Such inner experiences are definitely different in content from outer sense impressions. They are much closer in character to what we experience as pain or pleasure than ordinary sensory perceptions are. Now let's think of such an inner experience arising in the soul without being caused by either an actual outer physical sense perceptible object or a memory of one. People with supersensible cognition are able to have such experiences and to know that they are not imaginary but are expressions of beings of soul and spirit. If a soul spiritual being calls forth the same impression as a red object in the physical sense perceptible world, it can be called red. In the case of the physical object, however, the outer impression is always present before the inner experience of color, while in true supersensible perception in present day human beings, the reverse must always be the case. The inner experience is there first, like a mere shadowy memory of color followed by an image that becomes more and more vivid. This is how this process must take place, and the less attention we pay to this fact, the less we are able to distinguish between real spiritual perception and imaginary deceptions, illusions, hallucinations, and so on. The vividness of the image during soul spiritual perception of this sort, whether it remains very shadowy, as if dimly visualized, or whether its effect is strong like that of an outer object depends totally on the perceiver's inner development. The general impression that a clairvoyant observer has of the human ether body can be described as follows. When people with supersensible cognition have developed such strength of will that they are able to disregard what their physical eyes are seeing in spite of the fact that a physical human being is standing in front of them, they are then able to use supersensible consciousness to see into the space the physical person occupies. Naturally, it requires an intense heightening of their will for them to be able to disregard not only what they are thinking, but also something that is standing right in front of them, and to such an extent that its physical impression is extinguished. However, it is possible to bring this heightening about. It happens as a result of the exercises for achieving supersensible cognition. When people first perce perceive in this way, they get a general impression of the ether body. The inner sensation that arises in their souls is approximately the same as the one they get from seeing the color of a peach blossom. This becomes increasingly vivid and enables them to say that the ether body has the color of peach blossoms. After that, they also perceive the individual organs and currents within the ether body. However, the ether body could be described further by presenting soul experiences that correspond to sensations of warmth, sound, and so on, because the ether body is more than just a color phenomenon. The astral body and the other elements of our human makeup could also be described in the same sense. Having considered this, we will realize how spiritual scientific descriptions are meant to be understood. The Astral World As long as we are only observing the physical world, the earth as our dwelling place appears like a separate cosmic body. However, if supersensible cognition rises to the level of other worlds, this separation ceases. This is why it was possible to state that imagination simultaneously perceives both the earth and the moon stage as it has continued to develop into the present time. In addition to the earth's supersensible aspect, other cosmic bodies that are physically separate from the earth are embedded in the world that we enter in this way. Those who perceive supersensible worlds 
do not observe only the earth's supersensible aspect, but to begin with they also perceive the supersensible aspect of other cosmic bodies. Parenthesis, people who are tempted to ask why clairvoyants don't tell us what things look like on Mars and so on should keep in mind that clairvoyants are primarily concerned with observing the supersensible aspects of cosmic bodies, while they themselves, in asking this question, have physical sense perceptible conditions in mind. Parenthesis. That's why this book has been able to present certain relationships between the Earth phase of evolution and the simultaneous evolution of Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, and so on. When the human astral body is carried off into sleep, it belongs not only to earthly conditions, but also to worlds in which still other cosmic domains, parenthesis, the worlds of the stars, parenthesis, take part. Indeed, these worlds work into the human astral body even during the waking state, which is why the name astral body seems justified. Footnote from the Greek astron and the Latin astrum, meaning star. End footnote. Human life after death. This book has described the time after the death of the human being when the astral body still remains united with the ether body. During this time, a memory of the entire life that has just ended is present but gradually fades. See chapter 3. The length of this period of time is different for different people and depends on how strongly an individual's astral body clings to the ether body, that is, on how much power the astral body has over the ether body. Supersensible cognition can get an impression of this by observing individuals whose state of body and soul dictates that they actually ought to be asleep, but who are keeping themselves awake through, sleep, through sheer inner effort. It becomes evident that the length of time individuals can keep themselves awake without being overcome by sleep varies from person to person. After death, our recollection of our past life, that is the time of the astral body's connection to the ether body, lasts approximately as long as we would formerly have been able to remain awake in a case of extreme need. When the ether body is released from a human being who has died, something that can be described as an extract or essence of it still persists throughout this individual's later evolution. This extract contains the fruits of the life that has just ended and is the vehicle of everything that unfolds like a seed for the next life during the human being's spiritual development between death and a new birth. See chapter 3. The length of time that elapses <coughs> between death and a new birth, see chapter 3, is determined by the fact that an I usually returns to the physical sense perceptible world only after enough change has taken place there for it to be able to experience something new. While the I is in the domains of the spirit, its earthly dwelling is changing. In a certain respect, this change is linked to all the great changes going on in the cosmos, such as changes in the earth's relationship to the sun. However, these are all changes in which certain repetitions appear in connection with new conditions. For example, they are expressed outwardly in the fact that the point on the celestial sphere where the sun rises at the beginning of spring makes a complete circle in the course of approximately 26,000 years. During this period of time, therefore, the vernal equinox moves from one celestial region to another. In the course of one-twelfth of this 26,000-year period, or approximately 2,100 years, circumstances on earth have changed enough so that human souls will be able to experience something that is different from their preceding incarnations. But since people's experiences differ depending on whether they incarnate as women or as men, as a rule two incarnations, one male, one female, take place during a period of this length. These things also depend, however, on the character of the forces we take with us from earthly existence into death. So everything indicated here should only be taken as the general rule. The details can vary in many different ways. How long a human eye spends in the spiritual world between death and a new birth depends on the above-mentioned cosmic conditions in only one respect. In another respect, it depends on the evolutionary conditions a particular individual undergoes during this time. After a certain time has elapsed, evolution leads the eye to the, a state of spirit 
that can no longer be satisfied by inner spiritual experiences. It then begins to long for a changed state of consciousness that finds satisfaction in being reflected by physical experience. The individual's re-entry into earthly life results from the interaction of this inner thirst for embodiment and the possibility the cosmos offers of finding a suitable bodily organism. Because these two things have to work together, incarnation may take place in one instance when this thirst has not yet peaked, but an approximately suitable embodiment can be realized. In another instance it takes place when the thirst has already exceeded its normal intensity because there was no possibility of embodiment at the appropriate time, a person's general attitude toward life which is due to the makeup of his or her bodily nature is related to these circumstances. The Course of a Human Life The life of a human being, as expressed in the successions of conditions between birth and death, can be fully understood only when we consider the changes that take place in the supersensible aspects of a person's makeup, and not merely the physical, sense-perceptible body. <clears throat> we can look at these changes as follows. Physical birth represents an individual's breaking away from the sheltering physical body of the mother. After birth, the forces that the embryonic human being formerly shared with the mother's body are present only as independent forces within the newborn being. Later on in life, supersensible events similar to the events of physical birth take place and can be perceived by means of supersensible perception. Until a child begins to lose his or her baby teeth in the sixth or seventh year of life, the ether body is surrounded by an etheric covering which falls away at this time when the birth of the ether body takes place. Birth in quotes. However, the human being remains surrounded by an astral covering that falls away at puberty, sometime between the twelfth and sixteenth years when the quote-unquote birth of the astral body takes place. Still later, the actual I is born. Parenthesis, these supersensible facts yield some fruitful viewpoints on education, which are presented in my booklet, The Education of the Child from the Viewpoint of Spiritual Science. This booklet also provides further explanations of things that can be mentioned only briefly here. <coughs> Footnote Die Erziehung des Kindes von Gesichtspunkte der Geisteswissenschaft Gesichtspunkte, I think, sorry, first appeared as an article in Lucifer Gnosis, number 33, 1907, the magazine founded and edited by Rudolf Steiner in GA 34, contained in The Education of the Child and Early Lectures on Education at the Pacific Press, Hudson, New York, 1996 and footnote. After the birth of the I, we find our way into the circumstances of life and the world around us, and we become active within them in accordance with the aspects of our makeup that work through the I, the sentient soul, the mind soul, and the consciousness soul. After that comes a time when the ether body reverses its development, and it undergoes the reverse of its developmental processes from the seventh year onward. Previously, the astral body's development had initially consisted in developing the potentials latent in it at birth. Later, after the birth of the eye, it enriched itself through experiences of the outer world. After a certain point, however, it begins to nourish itself spiritually by feeding off its own ether body. It gnaws on the ether body. As life continues, the ether body also begins to feed off the physical body. The decline of the physical body in old age is related to this. Thus the course of a human life can be divided into three parts. One period when the physical and ether bodies are unfolding. A second when the astral body and the eye are developing. And a third when the ether and physical bodies are reversing their development. However, the astral body is involved in all the processes that take place between birth and death because spiritually it is actually born sometime between the twelfth and sixteenth years of life, and because it has to feed off the forces of the ether and physical bodies during the last period of life, what it is able to accomplish through its own forces develops more slowly than it would if it were not taking place within the physical and etheric bodies. As a result, after the physical and etheric bodies are cast off at death, the development during the purification period 
takes only about one-third as long as life between birth and death. Compare chapter 3. The Higher Domains of the Spiritual World Through imagination, inspiration, and intuition, supersensible cognition gradually ascends into the domains of the spiritual world where it, it has access to the beings involved in human and cosmic evolution. This also enables it to trace the process of human development between death and a new birth in a way that makes this process understandable. However, there are still higher domains of existence that can be mentioned only briefly here. When supersensible cognition has raised itself to the level of intuition, it lives in a world of spiritual beings who are also undergoing evolutions of their own. The concerns of present-day humanity reach right into the world of intuition, so to speak. In fact, we also experience the effects of still higher worlds in the course of our development between death and a new birth. But we do not experience them directly. The beings of the spiritual world bring them to us. So, by observing these beings, we can discover everything that happens to the human being. However, what actually concerns these beings, what they themselves need in order to guide human evolution, can only be observed by means of a mode of cognition that transcends intuition. This points to worlds whose lowest spiritual concerns can be viewed as including Earth's highest spiritual concerns. For example, rational conclusions are among the highest concerns within the earthly domain, while the effects of the mineral kingdom are among the lowest. In these higher realms, Rational conclusions are the approximate equivalent of mineral effects on earth. Beyond the domain of intuition lies the domain where the cosmic plan is fashioned out of spiritual causes. The Aspects of Our Human Makeup When it, is, when it was said in Chapter 2 that the eye works on the lower aspects of our makeup, the physical body, the ether body, and the astral body, and transforms them in reverse order into the spirit self, the life spirit, and the spirit body. This refers to how the I works on the nature of the human individual through the highest human faculties, which have only begun to evolve during the various stages of the earth phase of evolution. However, this transformation is preceded by one that takes place on a lower level, giving rise to the sentient soul, the mind soul, and the consciousness soul. When the sentient soul is forming in the course of a person's inner development, changes are taking place in the astral body. Similarly, the development of the mind soul is expressed in transformations in the ether body, while that of the consciousness soul is expressed in changes in the physical body. Details of these processes were included in this book's description of the earth phase of evolution. In a certain respect, therefore, we can say that even the sentient soul is based on a transformation of the astral body, the mind soul on a transformation of the ether body, and the consciousness soul on a transformation of the physical body. But we can also say that these three soul aspects are parts of the astral body, because the consciousness soul, for example, can exist only because it is an astral entity within a physical body that is adapted to it. It leads an astral life in a physical body that has been modified to become its dwelling place. The Dream State In this book, the dream state has already been described from a certain point of view in Chapter 3, quote, sleep and death, unquote. On the other hand, because the progress of evolution is such that earlier states play into later ones, we should think of the dream state as a remnant of the ancient pictorial consciousness that human beings possessed during both the moon phase of evolution and a large part of the earth phase. During our dreams, a remnant of what was formerly our normal state of consciousness appears in us. On the other hand, this state is also different from ancient pictorial consciousness. Ever since the eye first developed, it has been playing into the processes in the astral body that takes place during sleep while we are dreaming. So what manifests in our dreams is a pictorial consciousness altered by the presence of the eye. Since the eye is not, a con is not conscious of acting on the astral body, however, nothing belonging to the domain of dreaming should be considered part of what can truly lead to knowledge of the higher worlds 
in the sense of spiritual science. The same is true of so-called visions, premonitions, or second sight. These come about when the eye eliminates itself as a factor. As a result, remnants of ancient states of consciousness arise. Such states of consciousness are of no direct use to spiritual science, and what can be observed during them cannot be considered results of spiritual science in any true sense. Acquiring Supersensible Knowledge The path to acquiring knowledge of supersensible worlds that has been described in greater detail elsewhere in this book can also be called the direct path of knowledge. In addition to this path, there is also another that can be described as the path of feeling. However, it would be quite wrong to believe that the first path has nothing to do with educating our feelings. On the contrary, it leads to the greatest possible deepening of our feeling life. The path of feeling, however, turns directly and exclusively to feeling as its starting point in its efforts to rise to spiritual cognition. It is based on the fact that if the soul surrenders completely to a feeling for a certain period of time, this feeling is transformed into cognition, into a pictorial perception. For example, if the soul completely fills itself for weeks or months or even longer with a feeling of humility, the content of this feeling is transformed into a perception. It is indeed possible to discover a path to supersensible domains by making one's way through such feelings one step at a time. However, it is not easy for present-day human beings to actually carry this out under life's ordinary circumstances. Solitude and withdrawal from modern life are almost indispensable, because the impressions of daily life disrupt what the soul accomplishes by concentrating on specific feelings, especially in the early stages of inner development. In contrast, the path to knowledge that this book describes can be followed under any circumstances of contemporary life. Observing Specific Beings and Events in the Spiritual World One can ask whether meditation and other methods of acquiring supersensible knowledge permit only a general observation of the human being between death and rebirth and other spiritual processes, or whether they also make it possible to observe very specific processes and beings, for example a particular person who has died. The response to this must be that those who have acquired the faculty for observing the spiritual world through the methods described here can also reach the point of being able to observe detailed events in that world. They make themselves capable of establishing a connection to human beings who are living in the spiritual world between death and a new birth. However, we need to keep in mind that in the sense of spiritual science, this should happen only after we have gone through a genuine training in supersensible cognition. Only then are we capable of distinguishing between deception and reality with regard to specific events and beings. Anyone attempting to observe details without the right training may fall victim to many deceptions. Even the most elementary things, such as understanding how to interpret impressions of specific realities in the supersensible world, are not possible without advanced spiritual training. The training that leads to supersensible observation of the things described in this book also leads to the ability to trace the life of an individual human being after death. It also leads to being able to observe and understand all the individual beings of the world of soul and spirit who work from this hidden world into the outer manifest world. It is only possible for us to observe details with certainty, however, if we base this observation on our knowledge of the great general cosmic and human realities of the spiritual world, which concern all human beings. If we desire the one without the other, we will go astray. We are granted access to the particular domains of supersensible existence that we long for above all else only after we have struggled with the serious and difficult paths leading to issues of general knowledge in our efforts to find the key to the meaning of life. This is a necessary part of what we must undergo to observe the spiritual world. Only if we have taken these paths out of a pure and, unego, and unegotistical urge for knowledge are we mature enough to observe the details that would formerly have served only to satisfy an egotistical need, even though we might have convinced ourselves that we were only striving for insight into the spiritual out of love 
love for someone who has died, for example. Insight into details is granted only to those whose serious interest in general spiritual scientific knowledge has given them the possibility of accepting even the, d- the details as objective scientific truth without any egotistical desire. The end of chapter 7, and that is the end of the book and outline of esoteric science by Rudolf Steiner.